Temple of the Wind by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 266. The walls of the room were scorched in ragged lines as if lightning had gone wild in the place, another result of the same magic Richard had invoked when he destroyed the towers and when the doorway had been blasted open. Kalin strode quickly around the room, checking to see if there was anything that might be useful. There was nothing in the room other than the table, chair, and colo, except for a dusty set of shelves. Kalin was disappointed to find that there were no books on the shelves. There were three faded blue glazed lidded containers, probably once holding water or soup for the wizard on duty guarding the slip. A white glazed bowl held a silver spoon. A neatly folded cloth, or embroidery of some sort, sat on one of the shelves. When she touched it, it disintegrated into dust and little flakes where her fingers contacted. Kalen bent lower, seeing that the bottom shelf held only a few spare candles and a lamp. An abrupt sensation of icy alarm inundated her. She was being watched. She froze, holding her breath, telling herself that it was just her imagination. The fine hairs at the back of her neck stiffened. She felt a cold wave of goose flesh run up her arms. She strained to hear a telling sound. Her toes cringed inside her boots. She feared to move. Carefully, quietly, she let her lungs draw a needed breath. Slowly, ever so slowly, so as not to make a sound, she straightened a little. She dared not move her feet, lest the stone chips crunch. Courage, as thin as eggshells, urged her to hide behind the wall of the sliff's well. From there she could determine if it was only her imagination spooking her. Perhaps it was just a rat. She twisted to check the distance to the stone wall. Kalin sucked a cry as she flinched back. Chapter 36 The quick silver face of the sliff had risen above the edge of the stone wall and was watching her. The glossy metallic female features of the sliff reflected the lamplight and the room in a living mirror. It was obvious why Kolo called the sliff she. The sliff was a silver statue, except it moved with liquid grace. Kalin pressed a hand to her hammering heart as she panted, getting her breath. The sliff watched her, as if curious about what Kalin might do next. Kolo often said in his journal that she was watching him. Sliff! Kalin stammered. What are you doing awake? The face distorted into a puzzled frown. Do you wish to travel? The eerie voice echoed around the room. Her lips hadn't moved as she spoke, but she smiled pleasantly. Travel? No. Kalin took a step toward the well. Sliff, Richard put you to sleep. I was here. Master, he woke me. Yes, Richard woke you. He traveled in you. He rescued me, and I traveled back with him, in you. Kalin recalled that strange experience with a certain fondness. To travel in the sliff, you had to breathe her in. It was frightening at first, but with Richard there holding her hand, Kalin had been able to do it, and had discovered the enthralling sensation of traveling. To breathe the sliff was rapture. I remember, the sliff said. Once you are in me, I remember. But don't you remember Richard putting you to sleep again? He woke me from the sleep of ages, but he did not put me back into the long sleep. He put me at rest until I was needed. But we thought... We thought you had gone back to sleep. Why are you not at rest now? I felt you near. I came to look. Kalin stepped to the stone wall. Sliff, has someone traveled in you since Richard and I last did? Yes, I was used. Suddenly, realization broke through her surprise. A man and a woman, they traveled in you, didn't they? The Sliff smile turned sly, but she didn't answer. Kaylin touched her fingers to the stone wall. Who was it, Sliff, who traveled in you? You should know that I never betray those I hold within me. I should know? How would I know? You have traveled in me. I would not reveal you. I never betray my client. You traveled, so you must understand. Kalin licked her lips patiently. 
Cliff, I'm afraid that I don't know anything about you, really. You are from a time before my time, from another age. I only know that you can travel and that you helped me before. You were a valuable aid in defeating some very bad people. I am glad that you were pleased with me. Perhaps you would like to be pleased again, would like to travel again. A shiver ran up Kalen's spine. This had to be why Marlin was trying to get to the keep. He and Sister Amelia must have come to Aidendril from the old world in the slift. Jagang had said he had waited to reveal himself until she returned. How else could she have returned to him so fast except in the slift? Kalen swept out an imploring arm. Slift some very evil people, she halted, sucking a breath through her open mouth. Her eyes widened. Slift, she whispered. You took me to the old world before. Ah, I know the place. Come, we will travel. No, no, not there. Cliff, can you travel other places? Of course. Where? Many places. You must know. You have traveled. Name the place that would pleasure you, and we will travel. Kalen leaned toward the alluring, smiling silver face. The witch woman. Can you take me to the witch woman? I do not know this place. It's not a place, it's a person. She lives in the Rangshada Mountains, in a place called Agaden Reach. Can you go there to Agaden Reach? Ah, I have been there. Kalen touched her trembling fingers to her lips. Come and we will travel, the Slyph said, her haunting voice echoing around the ancient stone wall. The sound died out slowly, letting silence settle once more, covering everything like the veil of dust in the room. Kaylin cleared her throat. I have to do something first. Will you still be here when I get back? Will you wait for me? If I am at rest, you can let me know of your need and we will travel. You will be pleased. You mean, if you're not right here, I should call down to you and you will come to me and we will travel? Yes, we will travel. Kaylin rubbed her hands together as she backed away. I'll be back. I'll be back soon and we will travel. Yes, the Sliff said, watching Kalen retreat. We will travel. Kalen snatched the lamp from where she had set it on the floor near the shelves. She paused at the door, looking back at the quicksilver face floating in the gloom. I'll be back, soon. We will travel. Yes, we will travel, the Sliff said, as Kalen started running. Kalen had to struggle to think where she was going as she ran. Her mind spun with arguments. While she grappled with her alternatives, she also tried to pay attention as she turned down halls, raced through rooms, and dashed upstairs. She seemed to reach Library Hall before she was ready. Puffing, she realized that she couldn't run in on Kara and Berdeen in such a state. They would know something was wrong. Not far from the library, where the two moored Sith waited, Kaylin collapsed onto a padded bench, letting the lamp slip to the floor. She leaned back against the wall and stretched out her aching leg. She fanned her face with one hand. She gulped air and tried to convince her heart to slow down. She knew her face must be red as an apple. She couldn't walk in on the other two like this. Kaylin made plans as she rested, waiting for her heart to slow, her lungs to recover, her face to cool. Shota knew something about the plague. Kaylin was sure of it. Shota had said about Richard, May the spirits have mercy on his soul. Shota had sent Nadine to marry Richard. Kaylin vividly recollected Nadine's tight dress, her flirtatious smiles, her accusations, telling Richard that Kaylin was heartless. The look in Nadine's eyes when she talked to him. Kaylin thought about what she must do. Shota was a witch woman. Everyone feared the witch woman. Even wizards feared Shota. Kaylin had never done anything against her, but that had never stopped Shota from hurting her. Shota might kill her, not if Kalin killed her first. The distraction of making plans had allowed her to regain her composure. She stood, smoothed down her dress, and took a deep settling breath. Kalin put on her confessor's face and strode through the doors to the library where the other two waited. Kara and Berdine popped out from behind a row of bookshelves. The books were gone from the table. Kara eyed Kalin suspiciously. You've been gone long enough. It took me a while to find a way with shields I could pass. 
Verdine came out from behind the shell. Well, did you find anything? Find anything? Like what? Verdine spread her hands. Books. You went to look for books. No, nothing. Tara was frowning. Did you have any problems? No, I'm just upset about all this. About everything. The plague and all. I'm upset that I couldn't find anything to help. What about you two? Verdine swiped a stray strand of hair back from her face. Nothing. Nothing about the Temple of the Winds or the team who sent it away. I don't understand, Kalen said, mostly to herself. If there was a trial, as Colo said, then there should be a record of it. Well, Verdine said, we were looking through the other books to see if we missed any of the records of the trial. We didn't find any. Where else can we look? Kalen sagged in disappointment. She had been sure they would find a record of the trial for Richard. Nowhere. If it isn't here, then there must be no record of the trial, or else it was destroyed. From what Colo said, the keep was in an uproar at the time. They may have been too busy to keep a record. Verdine cocked her head. But we're going to keep looking for part of the night, at least. Kalen looked about the library. No, it would be a waste of time. The time would be better spent if you kept working on Colo's journal. If we don't have the record of the trial, translating the journal would be the best help to Richard. Maybe you can find something important in the journal. In the brightness of the library, Kalen's resolve was beginning to falter. She began to reconsider her plan. Well, Kara said, I guess we better get back then. No telling what Nadine will be up to. If she gets into Lord Rawls' room, You'll get blisters kissing him while he's asleep and helpless. Berdine pressed her lips tight and smacked Kara's shoulder. What's the matter with you? The mother confessor is a sister of the Aegeal. Kara blinked in surprise. Forgive me, I was only making a joke. She touched Kalen's arm. You know that I will kill Nadine if you wish. You have but to ask. Don't worry, Raina would not let Nadine into his room. Kalen wiped a tear from her cheek. I know, it's just that with all that's going on, I know. Her mind was made up. It might help Richard find an answer. It might help Richard discover something that would stop the plague. Kayla knew she was only making excuses to herself. She knew why she was going. Did you find what you were looking for? Raina asked as Kayla, Kara, and Berdine approached. No, Kayla said. There was no record of the trial. I'm sorry, Ryan said. Kalen gestured to the door. Has anyone tried to bother him? Ryan smirked. She came by. She wanted to check on Lord Rawl, to make sure he was sleeping, she said. Kalen didn't have to ask who came by. Her blood heated. And you let her in? Ryan smiled that dark smile of hers. I put my head in, saw that Lord Rawl was asleep, and told her so. I didn't let her have so much as a peek at him. Good. But she'll probably be back. Raina's smile widened. I don't think so. I told her that if I caught her in this hall again tonight, she would feel my aegeal against her bare bottom. When she left, there was no doubt in her mind that I meant it. Tara laughed. Kalen couldn't. Raina, it's late. Why don't you and Verdine go get some sleep? Kalen caught the quick glance to Verdine. Verdine, just like Lord Rawl, needs to get some rest so that she can work on the journal tomorrow. We all need some rest. Ulick and Egan here will watch over Richard. Raina slapped the back of her hand against Ulick's stomach. You boys up to it? Can you handle it without me? Ulick scowled down at the moored Sith. We are the Lord Rawl's bodyguard. If anyone tried to get into his room, there wouldn't be enough left for you to pick your teeth with. Raina shrugged. I guess the boys can handle it. Let's go, Berdine about time you got a good night's sleep for a change. Kara stood beside Kaelin as she watched Verdine and Raina stride off down the hall, passing a critical eye over soldiers on patrol. You are right about rest. You need to get some sleep too, Mother Confessor, Kara said. You don't look well. I... I want to check on Richard first. I'll be able to sleep better if I know he's all right. I'll be back out in a minute. She gave Kara a firm look to discourage any ideas she might have about going in with her. Why don't you go get some sleep, too? Kara clasped her hands behind her back. 
I will wait. Richard's room was dark, but the light coming from the window proved enough to find the bed. Kalen stood beside him and listened to his even breathing. She knew how distressed Richard was by recent events. She felt the same pain. How many families were suffering in grief this night? How many more would be suffering the next and the night after? Kalen sat lightly on the edge of the bed. She slipped an arm under his shoulders and strained to gently lift him. He murmured her name under his breath in his sleep, but didn't wake as she sat him up a bit and leaned the heavy weight of him against her. Kalen reached behind and picked up the glass with the sleeping potion Nadine had made. It was still half full. She held it to his mouth and tipped it, letting the potion slide to his lips. He stirred slightly and swallowed as she tipped the glass higher. Drink, Richard, she urged in a whisper. She kissed his forehead. Drink, my love. It will help you sleep. She tipped the glass a little more each time he swallowed, forcing him to drink more. When he had taken most of it, she set it behind once more. He murmured her name again. Kalin hugged his head, holding his cheek to her breast. She pressed her cheek to the top of his head as a tear rolled over the bridge of her nose and fell into his hair. I love you so much, Richard, she whispered. No matter what, don't ever doubt how much I love you. He mumbled something she couldn't understand except for the word love. Kalin eased him back onto the pillow and slipped her arm out from underneath him. She pulled up his cover. She kissed her finger and gently pressed the kiss to his lips before she left the room. On the way to her own room, she again told Kara that she should go get some sleep. I will not leave you unguarded, Kara insisted. Kara, you need sleep too. Kara glanced over out of the corner of her eye. I have no intention of letting Lord Rall down again. When Kaelin started to protest, Kara spoke over her words. I will be posting soldiers outside your room, too. I can nap there, and if anything happens, I will be at hand. I'll get enough sleep. Kalin had things to do. She needed Kara out of her hair. You saw how Richard was when he didn't get enough sleep. Kara let out a dismissive chuckle. Lord Sith are stronger than men. Besides, he was like that because he hadn't slept for days. I slept last night. Kalin didn't want to argue. She was frantically trying to think of how to overcome this obstacle in skin-tight leather. She couldn't let Kara know what she was doing. Sister of the Aegeal or not, Kara would tell Richard. There was no doubt of that. That was the last thing Kalen wanted. Under no circumstances did she want Richard knowing what she was going to do. She would have to think of a new plan. I don't know if I'm ready for bed. I'm kind of hungry. You look tired, Mother Confessor. You need sleep, not food. You won't sleep as well if you eat right before bed. I want you to get a good sleep, like Lord Rall. You can sleep well knowing that Nadine will not be going near him. I have a good idea of what Raina said to Nadine, and I can assure you that as brazen as that strumpet is, she has enough sense to heed a warning from Raina. You have no cause for fear tonight, so you can sleep well. Kara, what are you afraid of? Besides magic and rats, Kara scowled. I don't like rats. I am not afraid of them. Kalin didn't believe a word of it. She waited until they were out of earshot of a patrol passing in the opposite direction. What scares you? What do you fear? Nothing. Kara, Kalin admonished. It's me, Kalin, a sister of the Aegeal. Everyone is afraid of something. I wish to die in battle, not weak and sick in a bed, at the hands of some unseen foe. I fear Lord Rall getting the plague and leaving us without a master of Dahara. I'm afraid of that too, Kaelin whispered. I'm afraid of Richard getting the plague, and everyone else I love. You, Berdine, Raina, Ulick, Egan, and everyone I know here at the palace. Lord Rall will find a way to stop it. Kaelin hooked some hair behind her ear. Are you afraid of not finding a man who will love you? Kara flashed Kaelin an incredulous look. Why would I be afraid of that? I have but to give any man permission to love me, and he would. Kalin let her gaze drift from Kara to the columns at the sides of the room they were passing through. Their boot strikes echoed off the marble floor. I love Richard. A confessor's magic will destroy a man if she loves him. You know, when they're together. Only because Richard is special, has special magic, can he love me in return. I'm terrified of losing him. 
I want no one but Richard, ever. But even if I wanted, I couldn't. No other man could express his love for me except Richard. I could never have anyone else. Kara's voice softened in sympathy. Lord Thrall will find a way to stop the plague. They passed from the marble floor onto the quiet of carpets running up the stairs toward Kalin's room. Kara, I'm terrified of losing Richard to Nadine. Lord Rall does not care for Nadine. I can see it in his eyes that he has no interest in her. Lord Rall only has eyes for you. Kalin ran her fingers along the smooth marble railing as she ascended the stairs. Kara, a witch woman sent Nadine. Kara had no answer for that. Magic was involved. When they came at last to the door to her rooms, Kalen paused. She looked into Kara's blue eyes. Kara, will you make me a promise, as a sister of the Aegeal, if I can? With all that's going on, so much has gone wrong already. Will you promise me that if, if something happens, if I somehow make a mistake, the worst mistake I've ever made, and I somehow get things wrong, Will you promise me that you won't let it be her instead of me who has Richard? What could happen? Lord Rall loves you, not that woman. Anything could happen. The plague, Shota, anything. Please, Kara, I couldn't bear to think that if anything happened, Nadine would have my place with Richard. Kalen clutched Kara's arm. Please, I'm begging you. Promise me? Kara's intent blue eyes stared back. Mord Sith didn't take oaths lightly. Kaelin knew that she was asking for something of solemn importance. She was asking Kara to swear her life on this, for that was what it meant for a moored Sith to give her word. Kara brought her Aegeal up in her fist. She kissed it. Nadine will not have your place with Lord Rall. I swear it. Kaelin nodded, words failing her for a moment. Get some sleep, Mother Confessor. I will be here watching your room. No one will bother you. You can sleep well knowing that Nadine will never take your place. You have my oath. Thank you, Kara, Kalen whispered in gratitude. You truly are a sister of the A.G. If you ever want a favor in return, you have but to name it. Chapter 37 Kalen was finally able to send away Nancy and her helper, telling them that she was exhausted and wanted only to go to bed. She had to decline an offer of a bath, having her hair brushed, a massage, and food, but she let Nancy help her with her dress so as not to raise the woman's suspicion. Kaylin rubbed her bare arms in the chill after she was alone at last. She tested her wound under the bandage. It was healing well and hardly hurt her any more. Dreffen had helped it, and she supposed that Nadine's poultices had been a benefit too. Kaylin slipped on a dressing gown and went to the writing desk beside one of the hearths. The heat felt good but it only warmed one side of her. She pulled paper and pen from a drawer. As she took the silver lid from the ink bottle, she tried to organize her thoughts and what she would write. At last, she dipped the pen. My dearest Richard, I have something important to do, and I have to do it alone. I am serious about this. Not only because I respect you, but because you are the seeker. I bow to what you sometimes do that I wish would be otherwise. I understand that I must sometimes allow you to do what you know you must. I am the Mother Confessor. You must understand that I must sometimes do what I must. This is one of those times. Please, if you love me, then you will respect my wishes, not interfere, and leave me to do what I must. I have had to trick Kara, which I greatly regret. She does not know anything of what I planned. She did not know I was leaving. If you hold her liable for this, I will view it with the greatest displeasure. I don't know when I will return, but I expect that I will be gone for a few days. I am doing this to help our situation. I beg you to understand and not be angry with me. I must do this. Sign, the Mother Confessor, your Queen, your love for all time, in this world and those beyond. Kalen. Kalen folded the letter and wrote Richard's name on the outside. She opened it and read it again just to be sure she hadn't revealed anything she didn't want him to know. She was satisfied with, to help our situation. It was vague enough to mean anything. She hoped she wasn't being too harsh with the way she insisted he not interfere. Kalen brought a candle close and heated the end of a stick of colored sealing wax from the drawer. 
He watched the wax drip onto the letter, making a red pool, and then pressed the mother confessor's seal, twin lightning bolts, into the warm wax. She kissed the letter, blew out the candle, and propped the letter against it so it couldn't be missed. She never used to know why the mother confessor's seal was twin lightning bolts, but she did now. It was the symbol of the Kondar, the blood rage, an ancient component to a confessor's magic. It was magic so rarely invoked that she had never known of it. Her mother had died before she could teach Kaelin to call it forth if needed. After she had met Richard and fallen in love with him, she had invoked it by instinct. In the grip of that magic, she had painted a lightning bolt on each cheek as a warning to others not to get in her way. A confessor in the Kondar couldn't be reasoned with. The blood rage was the subtractive side of a confessor's magic, invoked for retribution. Kaelin had brought it to life within herself when she thought Dark and Rahl had killed Richard. It was called forth on behalf of someone, and could only be used to defend that person. It couldn't be used to defend herself. Like her confessor's power, which she had always felt in the core of her being, the Kondar was always there, now, just below the surface, a menacing storm cloud on the horizon. She had felt it instantly rip through her when she needed it to protect Richard blue lightning that destroyed all before it. Without the subtractive as well as the common additive magic, a person couldn't travel in the slip. The Sisters of the Dark and the wizards who had become the Keeper's minions could call on subtractive magic too. Kaelin went into her bedroom. She stripped off the dressing robe and tossed it on the bed. She pulled open the bottom drawer of the ornately carved chest and pawed through her thing, looking for what she needed. Inside were clothes she had worn before, when she had been on her journey, better suited to what she was going to do than was her white mother confessor's dress. She stepped into dark green pants. She pulled out a heavy shirt and threw it on, buttoning it up with shaking fingers. She tucked in the shirt and buckled the wide belt. She left the waist pouch. From the back of the drawer, Kaylin retrieved an object carefully wrapped in a square of white cloth. She set it on the floor and crouching over it, laid back the corners of the cloth. Even though she knew what it was and what it looked like, she couldn't help feeling a shiver when she actually saw it again. Atop the cloth sat the spirit knife Chandelin had given her. It was a weapon made from the arm bone of his grandfather. This knife had saved her life before. She had used it to kill Prindon, a man who had been her friend, but who had turned to the keeper. At least she thought she had killed him. She didn't remember exactly what had happened that day. She had, at the time, been under the influence of the poison Prindon had been giving her. She wasn't entirely sure that it wasn't the spirit of Chandelin's grandfather who had saved her. Prindon had lunged atop her, and the knife seemed just to be there in her hand. She remembered his blood running down the knife and over her fist. Inky black raven feathers spread in a fan from the round knob of bone at the top. Raven was powerful spirit magic to the mud people. It was associated with death. Chandelin's grandfather had sought the aid of the spirits to protect his people from slaughter by another people of the wilds who had gone mad with the bloodlust of war. No one knew the reason, but the result was a bloodbath. Chandelin's grandfather had called a gathering to ask the spirits for their help. His people were peaceful and didn't know how to defend themselves. The spirits had taught Chandelin's grandfather how to kill the Jokopo, and in so doing, they became the Mud People. The Mud People defended themselves and eliminated the threat. There were no more Jokopo. Chandelin's grandfather had taught his son to be a protector of his people, and Chandelin's father had in turn taught Chandelin. Kayla knew few men who were as good protectors of their people as Chandelin. In a battle with the army of the Imperial Order, Chandelin had been death itself. So had she. Chandelin wore this spirit knife made from his grandfather's bones and one made from his father. Chandelin had given Kaelin the one made from his grandfather so that it might protect her. Indeed, it once had. Maybe it would again. Kaelin reverently lifted the bone knife in her hand. Grandfather of Chandelin, you helped me before. Please protect me now. She kissed the sharpened bone. If she was to face Shota, Kaelin didn't want to do it unarmed. She could think of no better weapon to carry. She 
She tied the band made of woven prairie cotton around her arm and slipped the knife through it. It lay against her upper arm with the black feathers draped down over it. It was a surprisingly quick weapon to draw, held to her arm as it was. Even though she was going to see a woman she feared, Kalin felt decidedly better with Grandfather's spirit knife. Kalin pulled a light tan cloak from another drawer. She would have liked to have taken one that was heavier, considering the spring snowstorm, but she wasn't liable to be out in it all that long. Agaden Reach wouldn't be cold as it was in Adendrin. She was hoping that the light color would help her slip unnoticed past the guards up at the keep, and besides, with the light cloak, she could draw the knife faster. She wondered if it was folly to think she could draw her bone knife faster than Shota could cast a spell, or if such a weapon would even be of any use against a witch woman. She threw the cloak around her shoulders. The knife was all she had. Other than her confessor's power, Shota was wary of a confessor's power. No one was immune to the touch of a confessor. If Kalin could touch Shota, that would be the end of it. Shota had magic that in the past had prevented Kalin from getting close enough to use her power, though. But Kalin wouldn't have to be touching Shota for the blue lightning of the Kondar to work. She gave a mental sigh. She couldn't invoke the Kondar to defend herself. Kalin had defended Richard with the lightning before when the Screeling had attacked him and when the Sisters of the Light had come to take him. Kaelin felt a wave of realization course through her mind. Richard loved her and wanted to marry her, to be with her always. Shota had defied his wishes and sent Nadine to marry him. He didn't want that. Even disregarding the fact that Richard loved Kaelin, Nadine had caused him anguish, hurt him. He didn't want to be with her and only tolerated her presence because Shota was up to something and he feared to let that threat out of his sight, but he desperately didn't want to be forced to marry her. Shota was harming Richard. Richard was in danger because of Shota. Kalin could call the Kondar to defend him. She had done it before at the threat of the sisters taking Richard against his wishes. Kalin could use the blue lightning to stop Shota. Shota had no defense against that kind of magic. Kaelin knew how magic worked. This was magic from within her. Like the magic of Richard's sword, it worked through perception. If Kaelin felt justified in its use to defend Richard, the Kondar would do her bidding. She knew Richard didn't want Shota using him, controlling him, dictating what his life would be. Kaelin had justification. Shota was harming Richard. The Kondar would work against her. Kaelin paused, sitting back on her heels and prayed to the good spirits that they would guide her. She wouldn't want to think she was doing this for vengeance, or that she was setting out to murder someone. She didn't want to think that she intended to kill Shota. She wondered if she was trying to put justification to something that couldn't be justified. No, she wasn't going with the intention of killing Shota. She was just going to get to the bottom of this business with Nadine, and to find out what Shota knew about the Temple of the Wind. But if she had to, Kaelin intended to defend herself. Moreover, she intended to defend Richard against Shota, against her plan to ruin his future. Kaelin had had enough of being at the unfavorable end of Shota's capricious ire. If Shota tried to kill her or tried to force this suffering on Richard, then Kaelin would end the threat. Kaelin already missed Richard. For so long they had struggled to be together, and here she was leaving him. If the situation were reversed, would she be as understanding as she was expecting him to be? At the thought of Richard, she slowly pulled open the top drawer to her most prized of possessions. Reverently, she lifted her blue wedding dress from its place as the only item in the drawer. Her thumbs stroked the fine fabric. Kalen clutched the dress to her breast as tears took her. She carefully set the dress back in its place in the drawer before she got tears on it. For a long moment, she stood there with one hand on the dress. She pushed the drawer closed. She had a job to do. She was the mother confessor, whether she liked it or not. Shota lived in the Midlands and was therefore one of her subjects. Kaelin didn't want to die and never see Richard again, but she could no longer tolerate Shota's meddling in their lives, her tampering with their future. Shota had sent another woman to marry Richard. Kaelin wouldn't allow that kind of interference to go unchecked. Her resolve hardened. She reached into the back of a wardrobe and pulled a knotted rope from a peg. It was there in case of fire, 
so that the mother confessor could escape from the balcony. Opening the glass doors gave her a shock of snarling wind and snow. Kalin squinted against the storm and pulled the doors shut behind her. She drew up the hood and stuffed her hair inside it. It would do no good to have people recognizing the mother confessor, if anyone was even out on a night like this. But she knew that the guards up at the wizard's keep would be. She quickly secured the rope around one of the vase-shaped stone balusters and tossed the rest of the heavy coil out over the railing. In the darkness, she couldn't see if it reached to the ground. She would have to trust that whoever had put the rope in the wardrobe had checked to make sure that it was long enough. Kalen swung a leg over the stone railing, gripped the rope in both hands, and started down. Kalen had decided to walk. It wasn't that far. And besides, if she took a horse, she would have to leave it at the keep, and it might be found, giving her away, or else she'd have to turn it loose before she got there, only raising fears as to what had happened to her. A horse would also make it more difficult to get past the guards up at the keep. The good spirits had provided her with a spring snowstorm. The least she could do was take advantage of it. Tramping through the heavy, wet snow, she was beginning to wonder if going on foot was the wise thing to do. She stiffened her resolve. If she was already beginning to second-guess her decisions, she had no business going through with the rest of it. Most of the buildings were shuttered. The few people she encountered were too worried about making their own way to be concerned with a huddled figure struggling into the wind. In the darkness, no one would even be able to tell if she was a man or a woman. Before long, she was out of the city and on the deserted road up to the keep. All the way up the road, she pondered the best way past the guard. These were Daharan soldiers. It was always a mistake to underestimate Daharan soldiers. It wouldn't do to have them recognize her. They would report it. Killing sentries was the easiest way to get past them, but she couldn't do that. They were her men now, fighting for their cause against the Imperial Order. Killing them was out of the question. Whacking them across the skull to knock them unconscious was no good either. That was never a dependable way to silence someone. In her experience, hitting a man across the head rarely had the desired result. Sometimes they would not be knocked unconscious and would scream at the top of their lungs before anything else could be done, raising an alarm and bringing other guards ready to kill the intruder. Besides, she had seen men suffer and die from a blow on the head. She didn't want that. You only hit someone on the head if you intended to kill them, because you most likely would. The sister and Marlin had probably used magic to get by the guards unseen. She didn't have any magic that could do that. Her magic would destroy their minds. That left either a trick or stealth. The Haran sentries were trained in every kind of trick and probably knew more of them than she could even imagine. She was down to stealth. She wasn't sure exactly where she was, but she knew she was getting close. The wind was coming from the left, so she stayed to the right of the road downwind of them, crouching lower as she went on. When she got close enough, she would have to crawl. If she laid down on the snow, spread her cloak out over her, and waited for a short time, the snow would cover her back and hide her. Then she would have to proceed slowly, and if she saw a soldier, simply lie still until he passed. She wished she had remembered to bring gloves. Deciding that she was as close as she dared get, she moved off the right side of the road. She knew that the bridge would be the hardest part. It would funnel her into a relatively narrow space with no option of moving away from the soldiers. But the soldiers feared the magic of the keep and would probably not be close to the bridge. They had been twenty or thirty feet from it when she had seen them before, and in the darkness and snow, visibility wasn't great. She was beginning to feel better about her chances of getting by unseen. The snow would provide enough cover. Kaelin froze in her tracks as a sword blade appeared in front of her face. A darting glance revealed a sword to each side. Another man rested a lance on her back at the base of her neck. So much for stealth. Who goes there? came a gruff voice from the man in front of her. Kaelin had to think of a new plan and fast. She quickly settled on a bit of truth, mixed in with their fear of magic. Captain, you nearly scared me to death. It's me, the Mother Confessor. Show yourself. Kaelin pushed back her hood. I thought I'd be able to get past you unnoticed. I guess Daharan sentries are even better than I thought. The men lowered their weapons. Kaelin was the most relieved to feel the lance lift from the back of her neck. 
That was the killing weapon in a challenge. Mother Confessor, you gave us a fright, you did. What are you doing up here again tonight, and on foot no less? Kalen sighed in resignation. Get all your men together and I'll explain. The captain tilted his head. Over here, we have a shelter to get you out of the wind. Kalen let them lead her to the other side of the road, where stood a simple three-sided structure meant to give some relief from wind and wet weather. It wasn't big enough for her and all six men. They insisted she take the driest spot farthest inside. She was torn between satisfaction that even in a snowstorm no one got past the Haran guards, and wishing she had. It would have made it much easier. Now she was going to have to talk her way out of it. All of you listen carefully, she began. I don't have a lot of time. I'm on an important mission. I need your confidence, all of you. You all know about the plague? The men grunted and nodded that they did, shifting their weight uncomfortably. Richard, Lord Rahl is trying to find a way to stop it. We don't know if there is a way, but he won't give up, you know that. He would do anything it takes to save his people. The men were nodding again. What's that got to do with... I'm in a hurry. Lord Rahl is sleeping right now. He's exhausted from trying to find a cure for the plague. A cure that involves magic. The men straightened a bit. The captain rubbed his chin. We know that Lord Rahl won't let us down. He cured me a few days back. Kalen looked to all the eyes watching her. Well, what if Lord Rahl comes down with the plague himself? Before he can find an answer. Then what? We're all dead, that's what. The anxiety on their faces was clear. For Daharans to lose a Lord Rahl was a calamitous event. It cast all their futures into doubt. What can be done to protect him? The captain asked. What can be done is up to you men here tonight. What can we do? Lord Rahl loves me. You men all know how he protects me. He has those moored Sith shadowing me all the time. He sends guards with me wherever I go. He won't let danger come within miles of me. He won't let harm even get a view of me. Well, I don't want him harmed either. What if he gets the plague? Then we all lose him. I may have a way to help him stop the plague before it can touch us all, before he can get it, as surely he will. They gasped. What can we do to help? The captain asked. What I'm doing involves magic, very dangerous. If I'm successful, I may be able to protect Richard from the plague, protect all of us from the plague. But like I said, it's dangerous. I need to go away for a few days, with the aid of magic, to see if I might be able to help Lord Rahl stop the plague. You men know how he guards me. He would never let me go. He would rather die than let me be exposed to danger. He can't be reasoned with when it comes to my being in danger. That's why I tricked the Mord Sith and my other guards. No one knows where I'm going. If anyone finds out, then Richard will come after me and be in the same danger as me. What good will that do? If I'm killed, then he would be killed too. If I'm successful, there's no reason to expose him to the danger. I intended for no one to find out where I went tonight, but you men are better than I gave you credit for. Now it's up to you. I'm risking my life to protect Lord Rahl. If you want to protect him too, then you must swear to secrecy. Even if he looks you in the eye, you must tell him that you haven't seen me, that no one came up here. The men shuffled their feet, cleared their throats, and looked at one another. The captain's fingers fretted with his sword hilt. Mother Confessor, if Lord Rawl looks us in the eye and asks us, we can't lie to him. Kalen leaned closer to the man. Then you may as well slay him on the spot. That's what you'll be doing. Do you want to endanger your Lord Rawl's life? Do you want to be responsible for his dying? Of course not. We'd all lay down our lives for him. I'm offering to lay down my life too. If he finds out what I'm doing, where I went this night, then he will come after me. He can be of no help, and he may die because of it. Kalen pulled her arm out from under her cloak and passed a finger before each man's face. You will be responsible for endangering Lord Rawl's life. You will be exposing him to harm's view to no purpose. You may be killing him. The captain looked into the eyes of each of his men. He straightened and rubbed his face as he considered. At last he spoke. What is it you wish us to do? Swear on our lives? No, Kalen said. I want you to swear on Lord Rahl's life. 
At the captain's lead, the men all went to one knee. We give our oath on Lord Rao's life to tell no one that we saw you again tonight, and further to swear that no one went up to the keep except you and your two moored Sith earlier. He looked about at his men. Swear it. When they had all sworn, the men stood. The captain placed a fatherly hand on Kalin's shoulder. Mother Confessor, I don't know anything about magic. That's Lord Rao's business. And I don't know what you're up to tonight. But we don't want to lose you either. You're good for Lord Rahl. Whatever you're about to do, please be careful. Thank you, Captain. I think you men are the most danger I'll see tonight. Tomorrow is another matter. If you are killed, it ends our oath. If you die, we will have to tell Lord Rahl what we know. If that happens, we will be executed. No, Captain. Lord Rahl wouldn't do something like that. That's why we have to do what we must to protect him. We all need him, lest we be ruled by the Imperial Order. They have no respect for life. It is they who started this place. They started it among children. Kaylin swallowed as she stared into the silver face of the slit. Yes, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? A lustrous metallic hand rose up from the pool and touched the top of the wall. Come to me, the voice said, echoing around the room. You do not do, I do. Kalin climbed up onto the wall. And you're sure you can take me to Agaden Reach? Yes, I have been there. You will be pleased. Kalin didn't know about being pleased. How long will it take? The slith seemed to frown. Kalin could see herself reflected in the shiny surface of the slith's face. From here to there, that long. I am long enough. I have been there. Kalin sighed. The slith didn't seem to understand that she had been asleep for three thousand years either. What was a day, more or less, to her? You won't tell Richard where you took me, will you? I don't want him to know. The silver face distorted into a sly smile. None who know me wish others to know. I never betray them. Be at ease. No one will know what we do together. No one will know of your pleasure. Kalin's face assumed a perplexed expression. The liquid silver arm came up and slipped around her. The warm, undulating grip held her tight. Do not forget you must breathe me, the slip said. Do not be afraid. I will keep you alive when you breathe me. When we reach the other place, you must then breathe me out and breathe in the air. You will be just as afraid to do that as you will be to breathe me. But you must do it or you will die. Kaylin nodded as she panted. She rocked from one foot to the other. I remember. She couldn't help fearing to be without air. All right, I'm ready. Without further word, the slith's arm lifted her gently from the wall and plunged with her down into the quicksilver froth. Kaylin's lungs burned. Her eyes were squeezed shut. She had done it before, and knew she must, but she was still terrified to breathe in this liquid silver. Richard had been with her the last time. Alone this time, panic snatched at her. She thought about Shota sending Nadine to marry Richard. Kaylin let the air go from her lungs. She pulled a deep breath, inhaling the slift's silken essence. There was no heat, no cold. She opened her eyes and saw light and dark in a single spectral vision. She felt movement in the weightless void, at once fast and slow, rushing and drifting. Her lungs swelled with the sweet presence of the slip. It felt as if she were taking the slip into her soul. Time meant nothing. It was rapture. Chapter 38 through the warm swirl of color, Zed could hear Anne calling his name. It was a distant plea, even though she stood only a short distance away. In the flux of power atop his wizard's rock, it might as well have come from another world. In many ways it did. Her voice came again, irritating, insistent, urgent. Zed all but ignored her as he lifted his arms into the rotating smoke of light. Shapes before him hinted at their spirit presence. He was almost through. Abruptly, the wall of power began to collapse. The sleeves of his robe slipped down his arms as Zed threw his contorted hands higher, trying to coerce more puissance into the field of magic, 
trying to stabilize it. He was madly hauling a bucket from the well and finding it empty. Sparkles of color fizzled. The twisting eddy of light degenerated into a muddy gloom of color. With gathering speed, it slumped, foundering impotently. Zed was dumbfounded. With a thump that shook the ground, the whole elaborately forged warp in the world of existence extinguished. Zed's arms windmilled as Anne snatched the back of his collar and yanked him from atop his wizard's rock. He tumbled back, knocking them both to the ground. Deprived of enlivening magic, the rock too collapsed. Zed hadn't done it. His wizard's rock had reverted to its inert state of its own accord. Now he truly was baffled. Bags, woman, what's the meaning of this? Don't you curse at me, you contrary old man. I don't know why I bother trying to save your skinny hide. Why did you interfere? I was almost through. I didn't interfere, she growled. But if it wasn't you... Zed shot a glance at the dark hill. You mean? I suddenly lost the link with my Han. I was trying to warn you, not stop you. Oh, Zed said in a thin voice. That's very different. He stretched out and snatched up his wizard's rock. Why didn't you say so? He slipped the rock into an inner pocket. Anne scanned the darkness. Did you find out anything before you lost contact? I never made contact. Her gaze shot back at him. You never... What do you mean you never made contact? What were you doing all that time? Trying, he said as he reached for a blanket. Something was wrong. I couldn't reach through. Get your things. We'd better get out of here. Anne scooped up a saddlebag and began stuffing their gear into it. Zed, he said in a worried tone. We were counting on this. Now that you have failed... I didn't fail, he snapped. At least it wasn't my fault that it wasn't working. She slapped his hands away when he pushed her toward her horse. Why wouldn't it work? The red moon. She twisted and stared at him. You think? It's not something I do often or lightly. I've only made contact with the spirit world a handful of times in the whole of my life. My father warned me when he gave me the rock that it must only be used in the most dire of circumstances. Such contact risks letting the wrong spirits through and worse, tearing the veil. When I had trouble making contact in the past, it was because of a disharmony. The red moons were a warning of disharmony of a sort. We're running out of things to try. She yanked her arm from his grip. What's gotten into you? Said grunted. What's this you said about not being able to touch your Han? Anne stroked a hand along the flanks of her horse, letting it know she was close to its hindquarters. The horse pawed a front hoof as it wickered. When you were up on your rock, I was casting sensing webs to make sure no one was near. This is the wilds, after all, and you were making quite a show with all the light. All of a sudden, when I reached to touch my Han again, it was like falling on my face. Zed flicked his hand, casting a simple web to flip over a fist-sized rock lying at his feet. Nothing happened. It felt rather like trying to lean against something and finding out too late that it wasn't there. Like falling on his face. Zed reached into an inner pocket and pulled out a pinch of concealing dust. He cast it in the direction they had come. The breeze carried it away. It didn't sparkle. We're in trouble, he whispered. She huddled close to him. You wouldn't mind being more specific, would you? Leave the horses. He took her arm again. Come on. This time she didn't object as he took her arm and led her at a trot. Zed, what is it, she whispered. This is the wild, he stopped, lifted his nose, and sniffed the air. My guess would be Nang Tong, he pointed in the dim moonlight. Down here, in this ravine, we must do our best to stay out of sight. We may have to split up and try to escape in separate directions. Zed held her arm, helping her as her feet slipped on the dewy grass and wet clay of the steep side. Who are the Nang Tong? Zed reached the bottom first. He put his hands on her wide waist and helped her down. Her legs were short, and she didn't have the reach with them that he had with his. Without the aid of magic, her weight almost toppled him. With a hand, she caught a tangled mat of burr bush roots to steady herself. The Nang Tong, Zed whispered, are a people of the wild. They have magic of their own. They can't exactly use their magic for anything the way we use it, but it leeches the strength right out of other magic. 
like rain on a campfire. That's the trouble with the wild. There are any number of people in the wild who cause odd things to go wrong with your attempts to use magic. There are creatures and places here, too. There are trouble in ways you don't expect. It's best to stay clear of the wild. That's why I was so perturbed when after Nathan said we had to go to the Jokopo treasure, Verna told us that the Jokopo used to live somewhere in the wild. Nathan might as well have told us to reach into a roaring fire and pull out a hot coal. There are hazards everywhere in the wild. The Nang Tong are only one of them. So what makes you think it's these Nang Tong people who are causing the trouble with our magic? With most peoples of the wild to have this effect, it steals the strength out of our magic. But my concealing dust would still have worked. It doesn't. The Nang Tong are the only ones I know of who can do that. Anne held her arms out to the sides to help balance herself and keep her footing as she crossed behind him on a fallen log. The moon slipped behind the clouds. The return of darkness pleased Zed because it helped hide them, but it made it nearly impossible to see where to step. They would be no less dead if they fell and broke their necks than if they were run through with a poison arrow or spear point. Maybe we should show them that we're friendly, Anne whispered from behind him. She nabbed his robe so she could follow in the dark as he hurried along the flat beside the stream. You're always boasting and telling me to let you do the talking, as if you have a magic honeyed tongue to hear you tell it. Why don't you simply tell these Nang Tong that we're looking for the Jokopo, and we would appreciate their help? Many people who would seem to be trouble turn out to be reasonable if you only talk with them. He turned his head back so he could keep his voice low, and she would still be able to hear him. I agree, but I don't speak their language, so I can't win them over. If these people are so dangerous, and you know it, then why would you be so foolish as to take us right into them? I didn't. I skirted their lands by a wide margin. So you say. It would appear you've gotten us lost. No, the Nang Tong are semi-nomadic. They have no exact permanent home, but they stay within their own homeland. I stayed out of their homeland. It's probably a spirit raiding party. A what? Zed halted and crouched low, studying the lay of the land. He couldn't see anyone in the faint light, and he could only vaguely detect the foreign smell of sweat. It could be that it had been carried on the breeze for miles. A spirit raiding party, he said as he put his mouth close to her ear. It's a long story, but the ending is that they offer sacrifices to the spirit world. It is their belief that the newly departed Spirit will carry the Nang Tong's respect and request to their departed ancestors, and in return the spirits will look kindly upon them. The hunting parties hunt things to sacrifice. People? Sometimes, if they can get away with it. They aren't very brave when they encounter strong opposition. They would rather run than have a fight. But they will gladly pick off the weak or defenseless. In the name of creation, what kind of place is this Midlands, letting people get away with such things? I thought you people were more civilized than that. I thought you had this alliance through which everyone in the Midlands cooperated and saw to the common good. The confessors come here to try to ensure the Nang Tong don't murder people, but it's a remote place. The Nang Tong are always servile when a confessor comes. Her magic is one of the few not altered by the Nang Tong's power. It could be that because a confessor's power has an element of the subtractive to it, it isn't altered. Why would you fools leave these people to their own devices if you know what they are capable of? Zed scowled at her in the darkness. Part of the reason for the Midlands Alliance was to protect those with magic who would be slaughtered by stronger land. They don't have magic. You said they couldn't do anything with magic. Since they can nullify magic, make it impotent, then that means that they have magic. Those without magic could not do such a thing. It's part of the way these people defend themselves. It's their teeth, so to speak, used to defend themselves against those with powerful magic who would subjugate or destroy them. We leave alone people and creatures with magic. They have as much right to exist as we, but we try to ensure that they don't murder innocent people. We may not like all forms of magic, but we don't believe in exterminating the Creator's beings to make a world in the image of those with the most power. She remained silent, so he went on. There are creatures that can be dangerous, such as a gar, but we don't go out and kill all the gar. 
Instead, we leave them be. Let them have their own lives the way the Creator intended. It is not up to us to judge the wisdom of creation. The Nang Tong are diffident when challenged by strength, but deadly when they think they have the upper hand. They're a kind of scavenger, like vultures or wolves or bears. It wouldn't be right to eliminate those creatures. They have a part to play in the world. She put her face close so she could express her displeasure without yelling. And what part do the Nang Tong play? And I am not the creator, nor do I have conversations with him to discuss his choices in creating life and magic. But I am respectful enough to allow that he may have a reason, and it isn't my place to say he is wrong. That would be naked arrogance. In the Midlands, we allow all forms of creation to exist. And if it's dangerous, we simply keep away from it. You, of all people, with your dogmatic teachings of your version of the creator, should be able to sympathize with this you. Anne's words, whispered though they were, became heated. Our duty is to teach heathens such as this to respect the Creator's other being. Tell that to the wolf or the bear. Her growl could have been either. Sorceresses and wizards are meant to be custodians of magic, to protect it, just as a parent protects a child, Zed said. It is not up to us to decide which are good enough to have a right to exist. Which is worthy of life? Down that path lies Jagang's view of all magic. He thinks we are dangerous, and that we should be eliminated for the good of all. You seem to be siding with the Emperor. If a bee stings you, do you not swat it? I didn't say we shouldn't defend ourselves. Then why haven't you defended yourselves and eliminated such threats? In the war with Darken Rahl's father, Panas, your own people called you the wind of death. You knew how to eliminate a threat then. I did what I had to do to protect innocent people who would have been slaughtered, who were being slaughtered. I will do the same against a gang if I must. The Nang Tong haven't warranted annihilation. They don't try to rule others through murder, torture, and enslavement. Their beliefs result in harm only if we are careless enough to intrude. They're dangerous. You should never have let the threat continue. He shook a finger at her. And why haven't you killed Nathan to eliminate the threat he represents? Would you equate Nathan with those who sacrifice people for heathen beliefs? And I can tell you that when I get my hands on Nathan again, I will set him on the right path. Good. But in the meanwhile, this is a poor time to debate theology. Zed smoothed back his wavy hair. Unless you wish to begin teaching the Nang Tong your beliefs, I would suggest we follow mine and remove ourselves from their hunting ground. Anne sighed. Perhaps you have a point or two? Your intentions at least were benevolent. With a shooing motion, she signaled for him to get going. Zed followed the twisting gorge, trying to stay out of the sluggish ribbon of water running through it. The ravine led southwest. He knew that would take them away from the Nang Tong homeland. He hoped it would also conceal them while they fled. The Nang Tong had spears and arrows. When the moon came out between a break in the clouds, Zed put out a hand to stop Anne and squatted down to take a quick appraisal of the landscape while there was light enough for a moment. He saw little but the eight to ten foot high walls of the banks and, beyond, the nearly barren hill. There were scattered copses on distant hills. In the low valley ahead, the stream ran into a thicket of wood. Zed turned back to tell Anne that their best bet might be to hide in the brush and wood. The Nang Tong might be leery of a trap and stay out of such a place. The moon was still out. He saw behind them their perfect pair of tracks through the mud. He had forgotten that he couldn't hide their trail. He pointed so she would see them too. She gestured with a thumb, indicating that they should get out of the muddy gully. Twin, reed-thin screams in the distance cut through the stillness. The horses, he whispered. The screams silenced abruptly. Their throats had been cut. Bags, those were good horses. Do you have anything with which to defend yourself? Anne flicked her wrist and brought forth a dakra. I have this. Its magic won't work, but I can still stab them. What do you have? Zed smiled fatalistically. My honeyed tongue. Maybe we should split up before your weapon gets me killed. Zed shrugged. I wouldn't hold it against you if you wish to strike out alone. We have important business. 
Maybe it would be better if we split up to give a better chance of at least one of us making it. She smiled. You just want me to miss out on all the fun. We'll get away. We're a goodly distance from the horses. Let's stay together. Zed squeezed her shoulder. Maybe they only sacrifice virgins. But I don't want to die alone. Zed chuckled softly as he moved on, searching for a place ahead where he could take them up and out of the ravine. He finally found a cut through the bank. Roots of gnarled bushes hung down like hair, providing handholds. The moon slid behind a thick cloud. In the inky darkness, they climbed slowly, blindly, feeling their way with their hands. Zed could hear a few bugs buzzing about, and in the distance, the mournful call of a coyote. Other than that, the night was still and silent. Hopefully, the Nang Tong would be busy picking through Zed and Ann's things back with the horses. Zed reached the top and turned to help pull Ann up. Stay on your hands and knees. We'll crawl or at least crouch as we go. Ann whispered her agreement. She made her way atop the bank with him. They struck out away from the gully. The bright moon came out from behind the clouds. In a semicircle, right in front of them, blocking their way, stood the Nang Tong. There were perhaps twenty of them. Zed reasoned that there were more about nearby. Nang Tong hunting parties were larger. They were not tall and were nearly naked, wearing only a thong and a pouch of sorts that held their manhood. Necklaces made of human finger bones hung around their necks. Heads were shaved bald. They all had sinewy arms and legs and pronounced bellies. The Nang Tong had all smeared white ash over their entire body. The area around their eyes was painted black, giving them the appearance of living skulls. Zed and Ann peered up at spears, their barbed steel points glinting in the moonlight. One of the men chattered an order. Zed didn't understand the words, but he had a good idea of what it meant. Don't use the Dakra, he whispered over to Ann. There's too many. They'll kill us on the spot. Our only chance is if we can stay alive and think of something. He saw her slip the weapon back up her sleeve. Zed grinned up at the wall of grim faces. Would any of you men happen to know where we could find the Jokopo? A spear jabbed at him, then signaled them to stand. He and Anne reluctantly complied. The men, not up to Zed's shoulders, but about as tall as Anne, crowded in around them, suddenly jabbering all at once. Men pushed and poked at them. Their arms were pulled back and their wrists tightly bound. Remind me again, Anne said to him, about the wisdom of leaving these heathens to their unenlightened practices. Well, I heard from a confessor once that they are quite good cooks. Perhaps we will sample something new and delightful. Anne stumbled but caught herself as she was pushed on ahead. I'm too old, she muttered to the sky, to be mucking about with a crazy man. An hour of brisk marching brought them to the Nang Tong village. Broad, round tents, perhaps thirty of them, made up the mobile community. The low tents hunkered close to the ground, presenting the least possible purchase to the wind. Enclosures made of tall, stick fences held a variety of livestock. Chattering people wrapped head to toe in unadorned cloth to hide their identities from the sacrificial offerings about to take their prayers to the spirit world, turned out to watch Zed and Anne being prodded at spear point through the village. Their captors, covered in the white ash and with their eyes painted black, were hunters in the guise of the dead so there would be no danger of their being recognized as one of the still living. Zed was jerked to a halt before a pen while men undid the rope tie at the gate. The gate swung open in the moonlight. It seemed that the whole Nang Tong village had followed behind. They hooted and hollered as the two prisoners were hustled through the gate, apparently wanting to give messages to the two spirits about to go speak on the Nang Tong's behalf to their ancestors. Zed and Anne, their wrists still bound behind their backs, both fell when they were forcefully shoved into the pen. It was a muddy landing. Snorting shapes loped away. The pen was occupied by pigs. The way they had churned the ground into a quagmire, the village must have occupied this place for at least the past few months. It smelled like what it was. The spirit hunting party, nearly fifty, as Zed had guessed, split up. Some went back to tents, surrounded by gleeful children and stoic women. Others of the hunters encircled the pen to stand guard. Most of the people who stood around watching were calling out to the prisoners, giving their messages for the spirit world. Why are you doing this? 
Zed called to their guard. He nodded his head and inclined it toward Anne. Why? He shrugged. One of the guards seemed to understand. He made a cutting gesture across his throat and then indicated the imaginary blood running from the pretend wound. With his spear, he pointed at the moon. Blood moon? Anne asked under her breath. Red moon, Zed whispered in realization. The last I'd heard, the confessors had secured a pledge from the Nang Tong that they would no longer sacrifice people. I was never sure if they held to their promise. Just the same, people stayed away. The red moon must have frightened them, made them think the spirit world was angry. That's probably why we're to be sacrificed, to placate the angry spirit. Anne squirmed uncomfortably in the mud beside him. She gave Zed a murderous look. I only pray that Nathan's situation is worse than ours. What was it you said, Zed asked absently, about mucking about with a crazy man? Chapter 39 What do you think? Clarissa asked. She turned a little one way and then the other, trying to mimic a natural stance while feeling anything but natural. She wasn't sure what to do with her hands, so she clasped them behind her back. Nathan was lounging in a chair as splendid as any she had ever seen, its padded seat and back covered with striped tan and gold fabric. His left leg was draped casually over one of the chair's ornately carved arms as he slouched with his elbow propped on the chair's other arm. His chin rested thoughtfully in the heel of his hand. His sword's finely crafted silver scabbard hung down so that its point touched the floor in front of the chair. Nathan smiled that smile he had that said he was sincerely pleased. My dear, I think you look lovely. Really? You're not just saying that? You really like it? I don't look silly? He chuckled. <laughs> no, most definitely not silly. Ravishing, perhaps. But I feel, I don't know, presumptuous. I've never even seen clothes so fine much less tried them on. He shrugged. Then it's about time you did. The dressmaker, a thin, neat man with only a wisp of long gray hair covering the bald expanse atop his head, returned through the curtained doorway. He gripped each end of the tape measure draped around his neck, seesawing it nervously back and forth. Madam finds the dress acceptable? Clarissa remembered how Nathan had instructed her to conduct herself. She smoothed the rich blue satin at her hip. It's not the best fit, the dressmaker's tongue darted out to wet his lips. Well, madam, had I known you were to grace my shop, or if you had sent the measurements on ahead, I would certainly have made the appropriate alterations. He glanced at Nathan. His tongue darted out again. Be assured, madam, I can make any necessary minor adjustments. The man bowed to Nathan. My lord, what think you? I mean, if it were altered to suit you. Nathan folded his arms as he studied Clarissa the way a sculptor studied a work in progress. He squinted as he considered, rolled his tongue around inside his cheek, and made little sounds in his throat as if unable to decide. The dressmaker twiddled with the end of his tape measure. Like Madam says, it fits a little sloppily at the waist. Sir, have no fear. The dressmaker whisked around behind her, tugging sharply at the material. See here? I have but to take a dart or two. Madam is graced with an exquisite figure. I rarely have ladies so fine of form, but I can have the dress altered in a matter of hours. I would be most honored to do the work this very night and have it delivered to you at... at... Where would you be staying, my lord? Nathan flicked a hand. I've yet to seek accommodation. Any place you could recommend with confidence? The dressmaker bowed again. The Briar House would be the finest inn in Tanamura, my lord. If you wish, I'd gladly have my assistant run over there and make arrangements for you and madam. Nathan straightened himself in the chair and fingered a gold coin from his pocket. He flipped the coin to the man, followed by a second and then a third. Yes, thank you. That would be very kind of you. Nathan frowned in thought and then tossed the man another gold coin. It's late but I'm sure you could convince them to keep their dining room open until we arrive. We've been on the road all day and could use a decent meal. He shook a finger at the man. Their best rooms, mind you. I'll not have them sticking me in some cramped little sty. 
I assure you, my lord, the Briar House has no room that could remotely be considered a sty, even by one such as yourself. And how long shall I have my assistant tell them you will be staying at their establishment? Nathan stroked the ruffles on the front of his shirt. Until Emperor Jagang requires me, of course. Of course, sir. And would you like the dress, my lord? Nathan hooked a thumb in the little pocket in the front of his green vest, letting his hand hang. It will have to do for common wear. What do you have that would be more elegant? The dressmaker smiled and bowed. Let me bring some others for your approval, and Madam can try on the ones you fancy. Yes, Nathan said. Yes, that would be best. I'm a man of wide experience and refined taste. I'm used to better. Bring something to dazzle me. Of course, my lord. He bowed twice and rushed off. Clarissa grinned in wonder after the man had gone. Nathan, this is the finest dress I've ever seen. And you wish him to show us something better? Nathan lifted an eyebrow. Nothing is too good for a concubine to the emperor, the woman carrying the emperor's child. Her heart fluttered to hear the prophet say that again. Sometimes, when she looked into his azure eyes, she almost saw something there, almost had the vaguest impression, if only for an instant, that Nathan was quite beyond mad. But when that serene smile of his came to his face, she melted in his confidence. He was more daring than any man she had ever met, his daring had saved her from the brutes back in Renwald. Since then, his daring had saved them in circumstances that to her seemed worse than hopeless. There had to be a grain of madness in daring that far beyond bold. Nathan, I trust you, and will do whatever you ask of me. But please, would you tell me if this is just a story to pass us here? Or do you really see such a horrid thing for my future? Nathan brought his leg down and rose to his full towering height. He lifted one of her hands, bringing it to his heart as if it were the most fragile of blossoms. His long silver hair slipped over the front of his shoulder as he stood ever so close to her and looked into her eyes. Clarissa, it is just a tale to accomplish my goals. It in no way reflects anything I see about the future. I won't lie to you and tell you that there are not dangers ahead, but be at ease for now and enjoy this much of it. We must wait for a while and I wanted you to have an enjoyable time of it. You are pledged to do what you must. I trust in your word. In the meantime, I wanted nothing more than to do you a simple kindness. But shouldn't we hide where people won't know of us? Somewhere alone and out of sight? That is the way criminals or unskilled runaways would hide. That's why they get caught. It makes people suspicious. If anyone is hunting them, they look in all the dark holes, never thinking to look in the light. As long as we must hide, the best place to hide is in the open. The story is too preposterous for people not to believe in its truth. No one would ever consider that anybody would have the audacity to invent such a tale, and so no one will question it. Besides, we aren't really hiding. No one is hunting us. We simply don't want to make people suspicious. Hiding would make them so. She shook her head. Nathan, you are a marvel. Clarissa eyed the bodice of the beautiful dress, what she could see of it anyway, beyond the exposed flesh of her breast, which were pushed up so high that they nearly tumbled out. She tugged at the bone stays lying against her ribs under her bosom. She had never worn such strange and uncomfortable undergarments. She couldn't imagine why they were all required. She smoothed the silken skirt of the dress. Does it look good on me? I mean, honestly. Tell me the truth, Nathan. I'm just a plain woman. Doesn't it look silly on a plain woman? Nathan's eyebrow arched. Plain? Is that what you think? Of course. I'm no fool. I know I'm not. Nathan waved her to silence. Maybe you should have a look for yourself. He pulled the sheet off the standing mirror. This was a showing room for gentlemen. When he had instructed her on matters of decorum and propriety, he had told her that the mirrors in such a place were rarely used, and she wasn't to look in one unless asked. It was the look in the gentleman's eyes that mattered in such an exclusive shop, not the look in the mirror. Nathan gently took her elbow and walked her before the mirror. Forget what you see in your mind, and look at what others see when they look at you. Clarissa's fingers fidgeted over the bunched frills at her waist. She nodded at Nathan, but feared to look in the mirror and be disappointed by what she always 
saw when she looked at herself. He gestured again. Wincing just a little out of embarrassment, she turned to gaze at her reflection. Her jaw dropped at what she saw. Clarissa didn't recognize herself. She was not this young-looking. A woman, not a young, fickle woman, but a woman in the full glory of her maturity, a woman of elegance and bearing, stared back. Nathan, she whispered, my hair. My hair wasn't this long. How did the woman who worked on it this afternoon make it longer? Ah, well, she didn't. I used some magic to do it. I thought it would look better if it was just a bit longer. You don't object, I pray. No, she whispered. It's lovely. Her soft brown hair was done in ringlets, with delicate violet ribbons tied into them. She moved her head. The ringlets sprang up and down and swayed side to side. Clarissa had once seen a woman of standing come to Renwald, and she had hair like this. It was the most beautiful hair Clarissa had ever seen. Now, Clarissa's hair looked just like that. She stared at herself in the mirror. Her shape was so shapely. All those hard, tight things under her dress had somehow rearranged her figure. Clarissa's face blushed to see her bosom straining up the way it did, half exposed for all to see. She had always known, of course, that women like Manda Perlin weren't really shaped as they appeared. She knew that when they had their clothes on, their shapes were not a great deal different from any other woman, but Clarissa had never known just how much of it was due to the dresses those attractive women wore. In the mirror, in this dress, with her hair done in such a fashion, and with the paint on her face, she looked the equal of any of them, perhaps older, but that age seemed only to add bearing to what she saw not a spent, unattractive quality, as she had always thought. And then she saw the ring in her lip. It was gold, not silver. Nathan, she whispered. What happened to the ring? Oh, that. Well, it wouldn't do to have you supposedly a concubine to the emperor himself and carrying his little emperor heir and have a silver ring through your lips. Everyone knows that the emperor only brings those with gold rings to his bed. Besides, you were wrongly marked with a silver ring. It should have been gold from the beginning. Those men were just plain blind. He gestured in a grand fashion. I, of course, am a man of vision. He held his hand out toward the mirror. Look for yourself. That woman is too beautiful to wear anything but a gold ring. In the mirror, the woman staring back was getting tears in her eyes. Clarissa wiped a finger across her lower lids. She feared to ruin the paint the woman had put on her face when her hair was being curled. Nathan, I don't know what to say. You have done magic. You have made a plain woman into something... Beautiful, he finished. But why? His face screwed up with an odd expression. Are you daft? I couldn't very well have you looking plain. He swept a hand down, indicating himself. No one would believe a man as dashing as myself would be seen with a woman any less stunning. Clarissa grinned. He didn't look so old to her as he had seemed when she had first met him. He really did look dashing, dashing and distinguished. Thank you, Nathan, for having faith in me in more ways than one. It's not faith, it's vision for what others are too blind to see. Now they do. She glanced to the curtain where the dressmaker had disappeared. But this is all so very expensive. This dress alone would cost me near to a year's wages. And all the other things, the lodging, the coaches, the hats, the shoes, the women who did my hair and face, it all costs so much. You are spending money like a prince on holiday. How can you possibly afford it? The sly smile oozed back onto his face. I'm good at making money. I could never spend all I can make. Don't be concerned about it. It means little to me. Oh, she glanced back at the mirror. Of course. He cleared his throat. What I mean is that you are more important than petty matters of gold. People are more important than such consideration. If it was my last copper, I would have spent it with no less enthusiasm or greater worry. When the dressmaker finally returned with a selection of stunning dresses, Nathan chose a number for her to try on. Clarissa went into the dressing room with each, and with the aid of the dressmaker's woman, tried on each. 
Clarissa didn't think she would have been able to lace, tie, and button any of them by herself. Nathan smiled at each dress she came out in and told the dressmaker he would buy it. By the end of the next hour, Nathan had selected a half dozen dresses and had passed a handful of gold to the dressmaker. In all her life, she had never imagined a place of such wealth that dresses were already made. It was another measure of how much her life had changed with Nathan. Only the very rich or royalty would buy dresses this way. I will make the necessary alterations, my lord and had the dresses delivered to the Briar house. He darted a look at Clarissa. Perhaps my lord would wish me to leave several of them loose-fitting to accommodate madam when she grows with our emperor's child. Nathan waved a hand dismissively. No, no, I enjoy having her look her best. I will have a seamstress let them out when necessary, or simply purchase others to fit her then. It suddenly embarrassed Clarissa to realize that this dressmaker thought that she was concubine not only to the emperor, but to Nathan. The ring through her lip, gold though it was, still meant she was nothing more than a slave. A slave would mean little to the emperor, with child or not, gold ring or not. Page 295 Nathan boldly told people that he was Emperor Jagang's plenipotentiary, which kept them furiously bowing and scraping. Clarissa was merely property, shared with the emperor's trusted agent. The dressmaker's sidelong glance finally struck home. She was a whore in his eyes. Maybe a whore in a fine dress, and maybe not a whore by choice, but a whore nonetheless. A whore who was enjoying herself, being dressed in fine clothes, and kept by an important man at the finest inn in the city. The fact that Nathan didn't think the same thing was all that kept her from running from the dress shop in humiliation. Clarissa reproached herself. This was the pretense Nathan had crafted for them to keep them safe. It kept the soldiers they encountered at every turn from hauling her away to a tent. Deprecating glances were a small thing indeed for her to bear in return for all that Nathan had done for her and for the respect he always showed her. It was what Nathan thought that mattered. Besides, she was used to disapproving looks, looks of sympathy at best, scorn at worst. People had never looked upon her with favor. Let these people think what they would. She knew she was doing something worthwhile for a man of worth. Clarissa lifted her chin as she strutted to the door. The dressmaker bowed again as they stepped out into the dark street to the waiting carriage. Thank you, Lord Rao. Thank you for allowing me to serve the emperor in my small way. The dresses will be delivered before morning, you have my word. Nathan waved an off-handed dismissal to the man. In the dim dining room of the elegant Briar House, Clarissa sat across a small table from Nathan. She now noticed the surreptitious glances she got from the staff. She sat up straighter and put her shoulders back, defying them to have a good look at her bosom. She reasoned that in the murky candlelight and under all the face paint, they wouldn't be able to see her face reddening. The wine warmed her, and the roasted duck finally sated her gnawing hunger. People kept bringing food, fowl and pork and beef, along with gravies and sauces and a variety of side dishes. She nibbled at a few, not wanting to appear a glutton, and afterward she was satisfied. Nathan ate with zeal, but didn't overeat. He enjoyed the different dishes, wanting to try them all. The staff hovered around him, slicing meat, pouring sauces, and moving plates and platters around as if he were helpless. He encouraged them, asking for things, sending others away, and in general made himself appear an important man in their midst. She guessed that he was. He was the emperor's plenipotentiary, a man not to be crossed. No one wanted Lord Rahl to be anything but most pleased. If his pleasure required seeing to Clarissa's desires, they did that too. Clarissa was relieved when they were finally shown to their rooms, and Nathan had at last closed the door. She sagged, at last unburdened of the responsibility of acting a fine lady or a fine whore. She wasn't exactly sure how to play the part. She did know that she was glad to be away from the eyes that played over her. Nathan strode around the two rooms, inspecting the painted walls with gold molding applied to form huge sweeping panels with reverse curved corners. Rich carpets in deep colors covered nearly every inch of floor. Everywhere there were couches and chairs. 
One room had several tables, one for taking meals there, another with a slant top for writing. The writing table held neatly arranged sheets of paper, silver pens, and gold-topped ink bottles with various colors of ink. In the other room was the bed. Clarissa had never seen a bed like it. Four elaborately turned posts held up a canopy of lace and rich red fabric with gold designs splashed boldly over it. The bed cover matched. It was a huge bed. She had trouble imagining why such an expansive bed was needed. Well, Nathan said as he strolled back into the room with the bed. I guess it will have to do, Clarissa giggled. Nathan, a king would be delighted to sleep in such a room. Nathan's expression contorted in a casual manner. Perhaps, but I am more than a king. I am a prophet. Her smile faded as her mood turned earnest. Yes, you really are more than a king. Nathan went around the room blowing out most of the dozen lamps. He left the one beside the bed and the one on the dressing stand. He half turned and gestured to the other room. I'll sleep on a couch in there. You may have the bed. I'll take the couch. I wouldn't be comfortable in such a bed. I'm a simple woman, not accustomed to such grand things. You are. You should have the bed. Nathan cupped her cheek. Get used to them. Take the bed. It would be uncomfortable for me knowing such a lovely lady was sleeping on a couch. I'm a man of the world, and such things don't faze me. He bowed grandly from the doorway. Sleep well, my dear. He paused with the door half closed. Clarissa, I apologize for the looks you had to endure and for what people might have thought of you because of my story. He truly was a gentleman. No apology is necessary. It was rather fun pretending, as if I were in a play on a stage. He laughed with that sparkle in his blue eyes as he flung his cape around himself. It was fun, wasn't it, having those people think we were other than we were? Thank you for everything, Nathan. You made me feel pretty today. You are pretty, she smiled. That was just the clothes. Beauty comes from within, he winked. Sleep well, Clarissa. I've left a protective shield on the door so no one can enter. Be at ease here. You will be safe. He closed the door gently. Feeling a warm glow from the wine, Clarissa ambled about the room, inspecting all the fine things. She ran her fingers over the inlaid silver on the small tables beside the bed. She touched the cut glass on the lamps. She ran her hand over the finely woven bed covers when she turned them down. Standing in front of the dressing table, she looked at herself in the mirror as she unlaced the bodice of her dress. She almost hated to take off the dress and be just herself again, although she wouldn't be unhappy about being free of the bone stays that confined her. With the laces loose, she was at last able to take a full breath. She slipped the top of the dress off her shoulders. The thing still pressing from underneath held the dress up over her bosom. She sat on the edge of the bed as she tried to reach the buttons up the back. Some of them were too high. Sagging in frustration, she settled on removing her new shoes, made of supple, napped leather. She rolled off her stockings and wiggled her toes, glad to have them free. Clarissa thought about home. She remembered her cozy bed little as it was. She missed home not because she was so happy there, but simply because it was home and all she knew. As fancy as this place was, it felt cold to her, cold and frightening. She was someplace she didn't know, and she could never go home again. Suddenly, Clarissa was very lonely. With Nathan, she felt the comfort of his confidence. He always knew where he was going, what to do, and what to say. He never seemed to have any doubts. Clarissa was full of them now that she was alone in the bedroom. It was odd, but she missed Nathan more than home, and he was right in the next room. Nathan was almost her home now. The carpet felt good under her bare feet as she went to the door. Gently, she rapped against the white panel in the center of the gold molding. She waited a moment, and then knocked again. Nathan? she called softly. She knocked and called his name once more. When still no answer came, she cracked the door open and peeked in. Only a single candle cut the still gloom. Nathan was in one of his trances again. He was sitting in a chair, staring blankly at nothing. Clarissa stood at the door for a time, watching his steady breathing. 
She had been frightened the first time she found him stiff and unblinking, but he had assured her that it was something he had done nearly his whole life. He hadn't gotten angry that first time, when she shook him, thinking there was something wrong. Nathan never got angry with her. He always treated her with respect and kindness, two things she had always longed for, but had never gotten from her own people. And here was a stranger who gave them without effort. Clarissa called his name again. Nathan blinked and looked up at her. Is everything all right, he asked. Yes, I hope I'm not disturbing you in your reflection. Nathan waved away her concern. No, no. Well, I was wondering, could you help me undo my dress? I can't reach the buttons in the back and I seem to be stuck in it. I don't want to lie down in it and ruin it. Nathan followed her back into the bedroom. She had blown out the lamp on the dressing table so that she wouldn't be embarrassed. Only the one beside the bed allowed him to see what he was doing. With both hands, Clarissa held her hair up out of the way as his strong fingers worked their way down the buttons. It felt good to have him near. Nathan, she whispered, when he had reached the last of them at her waist. He made a questioning sound in response. She feared he would ask what the thumping sound was and she would have to tell him that it was her heart. Clarissa turned, having to hold the dress over her breasts now that it was undone. Nathan, she said as she gathered her courage and looked up into his beautiful eyes. Nathan, I'm lonely. His brow drew together as he gently laid one of his big hands on her bare shoulder. No need, my dear. I'm right in the next room. I know, but I mean that I'm lonely in a bigger way than that. I mean, I'm lonely for the way you... I don't know how to say it. When I'm alone... I start thinking about what I will have to do to help those people you talked about. And all kinds of fearful things come into my head, and before I know it, I'm sweating in a terror. It's often more worrisome to ponder something than it is to actually do it. Just don't think about it. Try to enjoy the big bed and the fine room if you can. Who knows, one day we may have to sleep in a ditch. She nodded. She had to look away from his eyes, lest she lose her courage. Nathan, I know I'm a plain woman, but you make me feel special. No man ever made me feel pretty, feel desirable. Well, as I said before, she reached up and put her fingers to his lips to silence him. Nathan, I really... She looked up into his wonderful eyes. She swallowed and changed what she was going to say. Nathan, I'm afraid you are just too dashing a man for me to resist. Will you come spend the night in this big bed with me? He smiled with one side of his mouth as she took her fingers away. Dashing? She nodded. Very. She could feel the curls springing. He rested his arms around her waist. It made her heart beat even faster. Clarissa, you owe me nothing. I saved you from what was happening in Renwald, but you in return have promised to help me. You owe me nothing beyond that. I know, it's not. She wasn't making herself clear, she knew. She stretched up on her tiptoes, her arms circling his neck, and pressed her lips to his. His arms drew her tight. She abandoned herself in those arms and to those lips. He pulled back. Clarissa, I'm old. You're a young woman. You don't want someone who's as old as I. How long had she hurt because she thought she was too old to have someone? How often had she felt forlorn because she was too old? And now this man, this wonderful, vibrant, handsome man, was telling her she was too young. Nathan, what I want is to be thrown on the bed, to have this fancy, expensive dress pulled off me, and for you to have your way with me until I hear the spirits sing. In the silence, Nathan stared at her. At last, he reached down, put an arm behind her legs, and swept her off her feet. He carried her to the bed, but instead of throwing her onto it, as she had suggested, he set her down gently. His weight sank into the bed as he reclined beside her. His fingers stroked her forehead. They looked into each other's eyes. Tenderly, he kissed her. Since her dress was all untied and unbuttoned, it easily slipped down to her waist. She ran her fingers through his long silver hair as she watched him lovingly kiss her breasts. His lips were warm against her. For some reason, she found that surprising and marvelous. A soft moan escaped her throat at the feeling of her nipples being kissed in such a manly, passionate fashion. Nathan may have lived longer than she, 
But he was not an old man in her eyes. He was dashing, daring, and thoughtful, and he made her feel beautiful. She found herself panting at the sight of him without his clothes. No man had ever touched her with such tender purpose, and the sureness of that touch further heated her passion. His kisses trailed down the front of her, each making her gasp to catch her breath in sweet, startled desire. When he at last took his place atop her, she totally and unashamedly succumbed to her need. She felt cradled, not only in the canopy bed, but in his ardent embrace. At long last, as her whole body stiffened with her cry of release, she could hear the spirit sing. Chapter 40 Like a hawk in a dive, Kalin silently shot ahead, and at the same time, like an eagle in an updraft, she serenely hovered in place. Light and dark, heat and cold, time and distance had no meaning, yet they meant everything. It was a marvelous confusion of sensations, heightened by the sweet presence of the sliff each time Kaylin drew the living quicksilver into her lungs, into her soul. It was rapture. With an abrupt explosion of perception, it ended. Light erupted in Kaylin's vision. Sounds of birds, breezes, and bugs hurt her ears. Trees draped with streamers of moss, rocks encrusted with lichen, and snarled in roots and vines, and patches of damp, dark mist crowded in all around. The overpowering presence of it all terrified her. Breathe, the sliff told her. The thought horrified her. No. The sliff's voice seemed to sear through Kaylin's mind. Breathe. Kaylin didn't want to be thrust from the serene womb of the sliff into this garish, loud world. She remembered Richard. And with Richard, the threat to him, Shota. Kaelin expelled the sliff from her lungs. The liquid silver sloughed from her, yet she was not wet. She gasped a deep breath of the strange, sharp air. She covered her ears and shut her eyes as the sliff set her on the edge of the well. We are where you wished to travel, the sliff said. Kaelin reluctantly opened her eyes and lowered her hands. The living world seemed to slow and settle into harmony with what she expected it to be. The comforting hand of the sliff slipped from Kalin's waist. Thank you, sliff. It was a pleasure. The sliff's fluid face smiled. I am pleased that you found it pleasurable. I hope not to be long. And then we must travel back. I will be ready when you wish to travel again, the sliff said her voice echoing out into the gloom. I am always ready to travel if I am awake. Kaylin swung her legs down off the stone wall of the sliff's well. Parts of an ancient structure were visible, but it seemed mostly to have crumbled into the damp, tangled forest. She could see a bit of a wall here, half of a column there, some paving stones on the ground, all covered with vines and roots and leaves. Kaylin didn't know exactly where she was, but she knew she was in the somber woods around the witch woman's home. Kaylin remembered going through this dangerous, mysterious forest when Shota had captured her and taken her to Agaden Reach in order to draw Richard there. Jagged peaks like a wreath of thorns sheltered the murky forest high up in the vast spine of the Rangshada Mountains. The dark and dangerous woods in turn surrounded and protected Shota's remote home. These woods kept people away from Agaden Reach, away from the witch woman. Whoops, clicks, and calls echoed through the stagnant stink. Kaylin rubbed her arms, even though the air was damp and warm. Her chill came from within. Through small, rare gaps in the forest canopy, Kaylin could detect the pink glow of the sky. It must be just dawn. She knew that the brightening day would bring no relief to the gloom of these woods. On the sunniest day, this morose place was never anything more than dismally dark. Kaylin stepped carefully, watching the forest floor, the hanging vines, and the drifting fog that seemed to conceal creatures issuing strings of hissing clicks and hooting calls. In the expanses of stagnant water lurking under the thick vegetation, she could see eyes just breaking the surface. Kaylin took another careful step and then paused. She realized that in the directionless forest, she didn't know where she was going. There was no telling north from south, east from west. 
this wood looked the same in all directions. She realized, too, that she didn't even know if Shota was home. The last time Richard and Kaylin had seen Shota was at the Mud People's Village. Shota had been driven from her home by a wizard aligned with the Keeper. Shota might not be here. No. Nadine had visited her. Shota was here. Kaylin took another step. Something snatched her ankle and yanked her feet from under her. She landed on her back with a hard thud. A heavy, dark shape sprang onto her chest, driving the wind from her lungs. A hiss, carried on fetid breath, came from between sharp teeth packed with gray, spongy filth. Pretty lady! Kaylin gasped to catch her breath. Samuel, get off me! Powerful fingers squeezed her left breast. Bloodless lips drew back with a wicked grin. Maybe Samuel eat, pretty lady. Kalin pressed the point of the bone knife up into the folds of skin at Samuel's neck. She seized one of his long fingers and bent it back until he squealed and released her breast. She jabbed the knife against his throat. Maybe I'll feed you to the things in the water over there. What do you think? Shall I slit your throat? Or do you want to get off me? The hairless, splotchy gray head drew back. Yellow eyes, like twin lanterns in the dim light, glared hatefully down at her. He carefully rolled to the side to let her up. Kalin kept the bone knife trained on him. Dead leaves and forest debris stuck to his waxy skin. A long arm lifted to point off into the dark mist. Mistress wants you. How does she know I'm here? The grotesque face split with a hissing grin. Mistress knows everything. Follow Samuel. He skittered a few steps and then stopped to look back over his shoulder. When Mistress is finished with you, Samuel will eat you. I may just have something for Shota she isn't expecting. She's made a mistake this time. When I'm finished with her, you may not have a mistress. The squat figure stared, appraising her. His bloodless lips pulled back and he hissed. Your mistress is waiting. Get going. The stocky, hairless, long-armed figure finally moved on through the undergrowth. He skirted dangers Kaylin didn't see and grudgingly pointed at things for her to avoid. Vines he circumvented reached for her as she passed, but she was too far away for them to catch her. Roots Samuel bypassed snarled up, trying to snare her. The short figure, dressed only in pants held up with straps, glanced over his shoulder occasionally to make sure she followed. A couple of times he gurgled his odd laugh as he bounded along. After a time, they picked up a trail of sorts. And not long after that, the light coming through the tangled mass of branches overhead became brighter. As Kalen followed the repulsive little creature, they came at last to the edge of the dark wood and the edge of a cliff. Far below lay the verdant valley where lived the witch woman. That it was as beautiful a place as any in the Midlands didn't ease the anxious knot in Kalen's stomach. All around the valley, the massive rocky peaks of the surrounding mountains soared nearly straight up. The budding trees in the placid valley below swayed gently in the early morning breeze. Descending the sheer walls of rock looked to be impossible, but Kaylin knew from being here before that there were steps carved in the rock. Samuel led her through a morass of brush, tight trees, and fern-covered boulders to a place that would be nearly impossible to find without him to guide her. A trail hidden behind rocks, trees, ferns, and vines ran to the edge of the precipice and the steps leading down the cliff walls. Samuel pointed off down into the valley. Mistress! I know. Get moving. Kalen followed Samuel down the cliff's edge. Part of it was a narrow trail, but most of the way down was comprised of thousands of steps cut into the rugged rock wall. They twisted and turned downward, sometimes spiraling back under ones above. Below, far off in the center of the valley, among the streams, grand trees, and rolling fields, sat Shota's graceful palace. Colorful flags flew atop towers and turrets as if to announce a festival. Kalen could hear the distant flags snapping in the wind. She had trouble seeing it for the splendid place it was. She saw it as the center of the spider web, a place where threat lurked, threat for Richard. 
Samuel sprang down the steps ahead, happy to be going back to the protection of his mistress, no doubt thinking about cooking Kalin in a stew when his mistress was finished with her. Kalin hardly noticed the hateful glances from the big yellow eyes. She, too, was lost in a world of loathing. Shota wanted to harm Richard. Kalin kept that thought foremost in her mind. It was key. Shota wanted to deny Richard happiness. Shota wanted Richard to suffer. Kalin could feel angry power welling up inside her, ready to do her bidding and eliminate the threat against Richard. Kalin had at last found the way to defeat Shota. Shota had no shield against subtractive power. It would slice through any magic she threw out. Kalin had found the path, the gateway through the labyrinth of protection layered over her magic to the core of its power. This side of her magic was protected by precepts that governed its use. Like the wizard's keep, protected by shields of all kinds, there was a way to get through. She had found a way to get through the keep, and she had used her reason to find the justification that traced its way through the maze of rationale forbidding this magic's use. She had tapped its ancient strength, its destructive power. Kalin felt the power coursing up through her and down her arms. Blue light snarled and snapped around her fists. She was nearly lost in a trance of purpose. For the first time, Kalin wasn't afraid of the witch woman. If Shota didn't swear to leave Richard alone, to let him have his own life, Shota was going to be dust before this day was out. At the bottom of the cliff, Kalin followed behind Samuel as he bounded along the road among tree-dotted hills and green fields. Snow-capped peaks all around soared up past a scattering of clouds. Blue deepened in the sky as the sun rose over those peaks. Kalin felt as if she had enough power blazing within her to level those peaks. Shota had only to say or do the wrong thing to prove herself a threat to Richard, and she would be no more. The road led up a gentle rise from which Kalin could see the spires of the palace through the trees ahead. Samuel glanced back to make sure she was still following, but Kalin didn't need his direction. She knew that Shota waited in the grove of trees below. The witch woman was the last person Kalin ever wanted to see again, but if it was to be, then this time she intended it to be on her terms. Samuel halted and pointed with a long finger. Mistress! Yellow eyes glowered back at Kalin. Mistress wants you. Kalin lifted a warning finger to his face. Threads of blue light crackled around the finger. If you get in my way or interfere, you will die. He glanced from her finger back into her eyes. His bloodless lips drew back as he hissed, and then he skittered off into the trees. In a cocoon of seething magic, Kalin advanced down the slope toward the waiting witch woman. The breeze was spring warm, the day bright and cheerful. Kalin felt no cheer. Sheltered among the towering maples, ash, and oak sat a table covered with a white cloth and set with food and drink. Beyond the table, atop three square white marble platforms, stood a massive throne carved with gold leaf vines, snakes, and other beasts. Shota sat regally, one leg crossed casually over the other, her ageless almond eyes watching Kalin's approach. Shota's arms rested on the chair's high, widely spaced arms, with her hands draped arrogantly over gold gargoyles. The gargoyles nuzzled her hands, as if hoping to be stroked. A rich canopy draped with heavy red brocade and trimmed with gold tassels shaded the throne's occupant from the morning sun, yet her luxuriant auburn hair shimmered as if touched by streamers of sunlight. Kalin halted, not far away, under the witch woman's rock-hard penetrating gaze. The blue lightning screamed for release. Shota clicked her lacquered fingernails together. A self-satisfied smile spread across her full red lips. Well, 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 Shota said in her velvety voice. The child assassin arrives at last. I am not an assassin, Kalin said, nor am I a child, but I have had enough of your games. Shota's smile slipped away. She put her hands to the chair's arms and stood. Points of her wispy, low-cut, variegated gray dress lifted in the gentle breeze. Her gaze never left Kalin as she gracefully descended the three white marble platforms. You're late. Shota held a hand out to the table. 
the tea is getting cold. Kalin flinched when a bolt of lightning struck from the blue sky, hitting the teapot. Amazingly, it didn't shatter. Shota glanced down at Kalin's hands and then back to her eyes. There, I believe it's hot now. Please, won't you have a seat? We will have tea and conversation. Knowing Shota had seen the ominous blue light, Kalin returned the self-assured smile in kind. Shota drew out a chair and sat. She again held out a hand in invitation. Please have a seat. I imagine you have things you wish to discuss. Kalin slid into a chair as Shota poured tea, holding on the white top with her other hand as she did so. Steam rose from the cups. The tea was indeed hot. Shota lifted a gold-trimmed platter, offering Kalin toast. Kalin warily pulled a golden crisp slab from the platter. Shota slid a bowl of honeyed butter across the table. Well, Shota said, isn't this unpleasant? Against her will, Kalin smiled. Very. Shota picked up her silver knife and spread honeyed butter across her slice of toast. She took a sip of tea. Eat, child. Murder is always best accomplished on a full stomach. I have not come to murder you. Shota's sly smile returned. No, I suppose you have managed to justify it to yourself. Retribution, is it? Or perhaps self-defense? Punishment? Recompense? Justice? The smooth smile widened, an eyebrow arched. Bad manners? You sent Nadine to marry Richard. Ah, jealousy then. Shota leaned back as she sipped her tea. A noble motive were it justified. I hope you realize that jealousy can be a cruel taskmaster. Kalen nibbled her crunchy toast. Richard loves me and I love him. We're engaged to be married. Yes, I know. For one who professes to love him, I would think you would be more understanding. Understanding? Of course. If you love someone, you want them to be happy. You want what's best for them. I make Richard happy. He wants me. I'm best for him. Yes, well, we can't always have what we want, now can we? Kalen sucked honeyed butter from her finger. Just tell me why you wish to hurt us. Shota looked genuinely surprised. Hurt you? Is that what you think? You think I am being spiteful? Why else would you always try to keep us apart to hurt us? Shota took a dainty bite of toast. She chewed for a moment. Has the plague come yet? The cup paused partway to Kalin's lips. How do you know about that? I'm a witch woman. I see the current of events. Let me ask you a question. If you visited a young child sick with the plague and the child's mother asked you if her child was going to recover and you told her the truth, would you be guilty of causing the child's death because you foretold it? Of course not. Ah. It is only I, then, who am to be judged by different standards. I'm not judging you. I simply want you to stop interfering with Richard's and my life together. A messenger is often blamed for the message. Shota, the last time we saw you, you said that if we stopped the Keeper, you would owe us a debt. You asked me to help Richard. We stopped the Keeper. It cost us dearly, but we did it. You owe us. Yes, I know, Shota whispered. That is why I sent Nadine. Kalin could feel the rage of power surge within her. Seems a strange way to show your appreciation, sending someone to try to ruin our lives. No, child. Shota said gently. You see things through blind eyes. Kaylin had to help Richard by finding out all she could, but she would defend herself and Richard if she had to. Until that became necessary, she could endure this wandering conversation if it would help get the answers they needed. And they did need answers. What do you mean? Shota sipped her tea. Have you lain with Richard? Kaylin was taken off guard by the question... But she recovered quickly. She shrugged one shoulder in an offhanded manner. Yes, as a matter of fact, I have. Shota's gaze rose from her tea. You're lying. Pleased by the smoldering tone in Shota's voice, Kalin lifted an eyebrow. It's the truth. You don't like the message, and so now you hold malice toward the messenger? Shota's eyes narrowed. 
her gaze locked on Kalin as if drawing a bow and aiming an arrow. Where, Mother Confessor, where did you lie with him? Kalin felt triumphant at Shota's obvious displeasure. Where? What difference does that make? Have you turned from which woman to gossip now? I was with him in that way, and that's the truth, whether you like it or not. I am no longer a virgin. I was with Richard. That's all that matters. Shota's gaze turned dangerous. Where? she repeated. Shota's tone was so threatening that Kalin forgot she needn't be afraid of the witch woman. In a place between worlds, Kalin said, suddenly embarrassed to reveal the details. The good spirits took us there, she stammered. The good spirits. They wanted us to be together. I see, Shota's gaze cooled. Her small smile returned. I'm afraid that doesn't count. Doesn't count? What in the name of all that's good does that mean? I was with him. That's all that matters. You're just vexed because it's true. True? You were not with him in this world, child. This is the world we live in. You were not with him here, where it counts. In this world, you are still a virgin. That's absurd, Shota shrugged. Think what you will. I am satisfied that you have not been with him. Kalin folded her arms. This world or another, it doesn't matter. I was with him. Shota's smooth brow puckered with mirth restrained. And if you have been with him in the place between worlds, where the good spirits took you, then why have you not been with him in this world, since you are no longer a virgin here, as you say? Kalin blinked. Well, I... We thought it best to wait until we were wedded, that's all. Shota's soft, exultant laugh drifted out through the morning air. You see? You know the truth of what I say. She held the teacup between the tips of the fingers of both hands as she sipped, more balmy laughter escaping between each sip. Kalin fumed, somehow feeling she had lost the argument. She tried to look confident as she leaned back and took a drink of her own tea. If it pleases you to delude yourself with punctilios, then be my guest. I know what we did, Kalin said. I don't know why it's any concern of yours anyway. Shota looked up. You know why it's my concern, Mother Confessor. Every confessor bears a confessor. If you have his child, it will be a boy. I told you both to remember that before you lay together. Lust dims thoughts of the consequences. From you, the boy would be a confessor. From Richard, he would have the gift. Such a dangerous melding has never taken place before. With a patient, reasoned tone, meant almost as much for herself as for the witch woman, Kalin hid her inner terror at Shota's prediction. Shota, you are a witch woman of great talent, and you may know it would be a boy, I grant you that, but you could not know he would be like most of the male confessors born in the past. Not all were like that. You have as much as admitted that you don't know if it would be so. You are not the creator. You can't know what he will choose to do if he even chooses to give us a child. I don't need to see the future in this. Almost every male confessor was like that. They were beasts without conscience. My mother lived in the dark times caused by a male confessor. You would visit upon the world not only a male confessor, but one with the gift. You cannot even envision such a cataclysm. It is for this very reason that confessors are not supposed to love their mates. If she bears a male child, she must ask the husband to kill the baby. You love Richard. You would not ask that of him. I have warned you that I have the strength to do what you will not. I also told you that it will not be personal. You talk about the distant future as if it has come to pass. It has not, Kalin said. Events do not always unfold as you say. Yet other things have already come to pass. Because of Richard, you still live. You told us that if Richard and I were able to close the veil, saving you and everyone else from the Keeper, you would be forever grateful to us both. And so I am. Kalin leaned forward. You show your gratitude not only by threatening to murder my child, should I have one, but also by trying to kill me when I come to ask your help? Shota's brow twitched. I have made no attempt on your life. You sent Samuel up there to attack me, 
And then you have the effrontery to rebuke me for coming prepared to defend myself. The little monster threw me on the ground and attacked me. If I hadn't had a weapon, who knows what he would have done. This is your gratitude? He said that when you were through with me, you would let him eat me. And then you expect me to believe in your benevolence? You dare to profess gratitude? Shota's gaze shifted toward the trees. Samuel? She set down her teacup. Samuel, come here at once! The squat figure loped out of the trees, using his knuckles to help himself bound across the grass. He ran to Shota and nuzzled against her legs. Mistress, he purred. Samuel, what did I tell you about the mother confessor? Mistress told Samuel to go get her. Shota looked into Kalin's eyes. What else did I tell you? To bring her to you. Samuel, she said with rising inflection. Mistress said not to harm her. You attacked me, Kalin put in. You threw me on the ground and jumped on me. You said you were going to eat me when your mistress was through with me. Is that true, Samuel? Samuel not hurt, pretty lady, Samuel grumbled. Is what she says true? Did you attack her? Samuel hissed at Kalin. Shota thunked him on the head with a finger. He shrank back against her leg. Samuel, what did I tell you? What were my instructions? Samuel must guide Mother Confessor back. Samuel must not touch Mother Confessor. Samuel must not hurt Mother Confessor. Samuel must not threaten Mother Confessor. Shota drummed her fingers on the table. And did you disobey me, Samuel? Samuel hid his head under the hem of her dress. Samuel, answer my question at once. Is what the Mother Confessor says true? Yes, mistress, Samuel whined. I'm very disappointed in you, Samuel. Samuel, sorry. We will discuss this later. Leave us. The witch woman's servant skittered away into the trees. Shota turned back to face Kalin's eyes. I told him not to harm or threaten you. I can understand why you would be upset and think I meant you harm. Please accept my apology. She poured Kalin more tea. You see, I have no intention of hurting you. Kalin took a sip from her full cup. Samuel is the least of it. I know you want to hurt me and Richard, but I'm not afraid of you anymore. You can no longer harm me. Shota's smug smile returned. Really? I'd suggest you not try to use your power against me. My power? All things I do, all things everyone does is using their power. To breathe is to use my power. I'm talking about hurting me. If you dare try it, you'll not survive the attempt. Child, I have no wish to harm you, despite what you think. A brave thing to say, now that you know you can't. Really? Did you ever think that the tea might be poisoned? Her smile widened when Kalin stiffened. You... Of course not. I told you I have no wish to harm you. If I wished to harm you, I could do any number of things. I could have simply put a viper behind your heels. Vipers dislike sudden movement. If there was one thing Kalin hated, it was snakes, and Shota knew it. Relax, child, there is no viper under your chair. Shota took a bite of her toast. Kalin eased her breath out. But you wished to make me think there might be. What I wished is for you to realize that confidence can be overrated. If it will please you, I will tell you that I have always regarded you as singularly dangerous for any number of reasons. That you have found a way to tap the other side of your magic means little to me. It is the other things you do that frighten me. Your womb frightens me. Your arrogant certitude frightens me. Kayla nearly leaped to her feet in anger, but then she suddenly thought of the children dying back in Aden Drill. How many of them hung near death, shivering in fear for their lives, while Kalin stubbornly debated fault and imputation with Shota? Shota knew something about the plague and about the winds hunting Richard. What significance was Kalin's pride in the face of that? She remembered, too, part of the prophecy. No blade forged of steel or conjured of sorcery can touch this foe. In much the same way, crossing swords with Shota wasn't going to work. This was serving no purpose 
and worse, solving nothing. Kaylin admitted to herself that she had come for vengeance. Her true duty should be to help people who were suffering and dying. How would anything but pride be satisfied by striking out at Shota? She was stubbornly putting herself and her insecurity above innocent lives. She was being selfish. Shota, I came with hurt in my heart because of Nadine. I wanted you to leave Richard and me be. You say you have no wish to harm us and that your intent is to help. I also wish to help people who are desperate and dying. Why don't we, for the moment at least, agree to take each other's word as true? Shota watched over her teacup. What an outrageous concept. Kaylin reasoned with her inner fear, her inner rage. Her anguish at the things Nadine did made Kaylin want to strike out at Shota. What if it wasn't Shota's fault? What if Nadine was acting on her own much the same way as Samuel had? What if Shota was telling the truth if she had not meant to cause harm? If that were true, then Kaylin was guilty of a grievous wrong in wanting to strike out at Shota. Kaylin admitted to herself that Shota had been right, that she had been justifying vengeance simply to be able to tap her deadly power. She hadn't been willing to listen. Kaylin placed her hands on the table. Shota sipped her tea as she watched the blue glow around Kaylin's hands fade and finally extinguish. Kaylin didn't know if she would be able to call it forth should Shota strike, but she realized it didn't matter. Failure in her true task was too great a price to pay for pride. Kaylin felt that this was the only thing that could truly have a chance of saving her future, of saving Richard, and of saving those innocent people back in Aden Drill. Richard always said to think of the solution, not the problem. She would trust in Shota's word. Shota, Kaylin whispered, I always thought the worst of you. Fear has been only part of it. As you warned, jealousy has been my taskmaster. I beg you forgive my obstinacy and insolence. I know that you have tried to help people before. Please help me now. I need answers. Lives depend on this. Please talk with me. I'll try to hear with an open mind the things you say, knowing that you are the messenger and not the cause. Shota set down her teacup. Congratulations, Mother Confessor. You have earned the right to ask me questions. Have the courage to hear the answers, and they will be of aid to you. I swear to do my best, Kalen said. Chapter 41 Shota poured them more tea. What do you wish to know? Kalen reached for her cup. Do you know anything about the Temple of the Winds? No. Kalen paused, cup in hand. Well, you told Nadine that the winds hunt Richard. I did. Could you explain that, what you meant? Shota lifted a hand in a vague gesture. I don't know how to explain to a woman who is not a witch how I see the flow of time, the passing of future events. I guess you could say that it's something like memories. When you think about a past event, or a person, say, the memory comes to you. Sometimes you more vividly remember past events, some things you can't recall. My talent is like that. Except I'm also able to do the same with the future. To me, there is little difference between past, present, and future. I ride a current of time, seeing both upstream and down. To me, seeing the future is as simple as it is for you to remember the flow of past events. But sometimes I can't remember things, Kalen said. It is the same with me. I can't recall whatever happened to a bird my mother would call when I was very young. I remember it sitting on her finger as she spoke soft, tender words to it. I don't remember if it died or if it flew away. Other events, such as the death of a loved one, I remember vividly. I remember the texture of the dress my mother wore on the day she died. Even today, I could measure out for you the length of the loose thread on the sleeve. I understand. Kaylin stared down into her tea. I, too, remember well the day my mother died. I remember every horrid detail, even though I wish I could forget. Shota placed her elbows on the table and twined her fingers together. The future is that way with me. I can't always see pleasant future events that I wish to see, and I sometimes can't avoid seeing those things I abhor. Some events I can see with clarity, and others, despite how much I wish to see them, are only shadows in the fog. 
What about the winds hunting Richard? With a distant look, Shota shook her head. That was disturbing. It was as if someone else's memory was being forced on me. As if someone else was using me to pass on a message. Do you think it was a message or a warning? A thoughtful frown creased Shota's brow. I wondered that myself. I don't know the answer. I passed it on through Nadine because I thought Richard should know in either case. Kaylin rubbed her forehead. Shota, when the plague started, it started among children who had been playing or watching a game. Ja-la. Yes, that's right. Emperor Jagang, the dream walker. Kaylin looked up. You know of him? He visits my future memories occasionally. He plays tricks, trying to get into my dreams. I won't allow it. Do you think it possible that it was the dream walker who gave you this message about the winds hunting Richard? No. I know his tricks. Take my word, it was not a message from Jagang. What of the plague and the Ja La game? Well, Jagang used his ability as a dreamwalker to slip into the mind of a wizard he sent to assassinate Richard. He was at the Ja La game, the wizard, I mean. Jagang saw the game through this wizard's eyes. Jagang was incensed that Richard had changed the rules so that all the children could play. The plague started among those children. That's one reason we think Jagang was responsible. The first child we went to see was near death. Kaylin closed her eyes and covered them with her fingertips at the memory. She took a settling breath. While Richard and I knelt at his side, he died. He was just a boy, an innocent boy. His whole body was rotting from the plague. I can't imagine the suffering he endured. He died before our eyes. I'm sorry, Shota whispered. Kaylin composed herself before looking up. After he had died, his hand reached up and grabbed a hold of Richard's shirt. His lungs filled with air. He pulled Richard close and he said, The winds hunt you. A troubled sigh came from across the table. Then I was right. It was not something I saw, but a message sent through me. Shota, Richard thinks it means that the temple of the winds is hunting him. He has a journal from a man who lived during the Great War of 3,000 years ago. The journal tells of how the wizards of that time placed things of great value and great danger in the temple, and then they sent the temple away. Frowning, Shota leaned forward. Away? Away where? We don't know. The Temple of the Winds was atop Mount Kaimermost. I know the place. There is no temple there. Only a few bits of old ruins. Kalin nodded. It's possible the wizards used their power to blast the side of the mountain away and bury the temple in a rock slide. Whatever they did, it's gone. From information in the journal, Richard believes that the red moons were a warning from the temple. He further believes that the Temple of the Winds is also known more simply as the Winds. Shota tapped a finger against the side of her teacup. So the message could have come directly from the Temple of the Winds. Do you think that possible? How could a place send a message? The wizards of that time could do things with magic we can only wonder at. The Slyph, for example. From what I know and what you have told me, my best guess would be that Jagang has somehow stolen something deadly from the Temple of the Winds and used it to start the plague. Kalin felt a cold wave of fright flood through her. How could he do such a thing? He is a dream walker. He has access to untold knowledge. Despite his crude objectives, he is anything but stupid. I have been touched by his mind in my sleep when he hunts in the night. He is not to be underestimated. Shota, he wishes to extinguish all magic. Shota lifted an eyebrow. I have already told you I will answer your questions. There is no need to convince me of my own interest in this matter. Just as the danger from the Keeper, Jagang is no less a threat to me. He promises to eliminate magic, but to accomplish those ends, he uses magic. But how could he have stolen this plague from the Temple of the Winds? Do you think it even possible, really? I can tell you that the plague did not start of its own account. Your guess is correct. It was ignited through magic. How can we stop it? I know of no cure for plague. 
Shota took a sip of her tea. She glanced up at Kalin. On the other hand, how could a plague be started? Magic, Kalin frowned. You mean... You mean that if magic could start it, even though we don't know how to cure the plague, magic may be able to stop it? Is that what you're suggesting? Shota shrugged. I know no more how to start a plague than to cure it. I know magic started this one. If magic started it, then it would stand to reason that magic could halt it. Kalin straightened. Then there is hope we can stop it and save all those people from dying. Possibly. If we were to put the pieces together, it would at least suggest that Jagang stole from the Temple of the Winds magic to start the plague and that the temple is trying to warn Richard of the violation. Why Richard? Why do you think? What makes Richard different from anyone else? Kalin felt transfixed by Shota's small, sly smile. He's a war wizard. He has subtractive magic. It's how he defeated the spirit of Dark and Rall and stopped the Keeper. Richard is the only one with the power to do whatever it is that can help. Keep that in mind, Shota whispered into her teacup. Kalin was suddenly getting the feeling that she was being led down a path. She dismissed the feeling. Shota was trying to help. Kalin gathered her courage. Shota, why did you send Nadine? To marry Richard. Why Nadine? Shota's lips spread in a sad smile. It was the question for which she had been waiting. Because I care about him. I wanted it to be someone in whom he could find at least some small comfort. Kalin swallowed. But he finds comfort in me. I know. But he is to marry another. The flow of the future tells you this? Your future memory? Shota gave her a single nod. It wasn't your idea? You didn't simply want to send someone to marry him so I wouldn't? No. Shota leaned back in her chair and stared off into the trees. I saw that he will marry another. I see great pain for him in this. I exerted all my influence so that it would be someone he knew. Someone in whom he would find at least some solace. I wanted to spare him as much pain in it as I could. Kalin didn't know what to say. She felt as she had when she was struggling against the flow of water down in the drainage tunnel when she was fighting Marlin. She remembered the weight of the water, the way it pinned her in place. But I love him, was all she could think to say. I know, Shota whispered back. It was not my choice to have him marry another. I was only able to influence who it would be. Kaelin struggled to pull a shaky breath as she looked away from the witch woman's ageless eyes. I had no say, Shota added, in who would be your husband. Kaelin's gaze returned to Shota. What? What do you mean? You are to be wedded. It is not Richard. I could not influence that part of it. That is not a good sign. Kaelin felt stunned. What do you mean? The spirits are somehow involved in this. They would only accept limited influence. They have their reasons for the rest of it. Those reasons are veiled from me. Kalin felt a tear run down her cheek. Shota, what am I to do? I'll lose my only love. I could never love anyone but Richard, even if I wished it. I'm a confessor. Shota sat still as stone as she watched Kalin. The good spirits have granted us all they could in allowing me to have a say in who will be Richard's bride. I searched and could find no other woman for whom he feels even this limited empathy. She was the best I could do. If you truly love Richard, then you should try to find comfort in the fact that he will have Nadine, a woman he knows and for whom he at least has some feeling, however small. Perhaps with a woman such as this, he will someday find happiness and come to love her. Kalin put her trembling hands in her lap. She felt sick to her stomach. It would do no good to argue with Shota. This wasn't her doing. The spirits were involved. To what purpose? What good will it do for him to marry Nadine? For me to be mated to one I don't love? Shota's voice came soft and compassionate. I don't know, child. Just as some parents, for a variety of reasons, choose their children's spouses, so have the spirits chosen for you and Richard. If the spirits would involved, why would they desire our misery? They took us to that place so we could be together. Kalin struggled against the weight of the floodwaters. 
Why would they want to do this to us? Perhaps, Shota whispered as she watched Kalin, it is because you will betray him. Kalin's throat clenched shut, locking her breath in her lungs. The prophecy screamed through her head. For the one in white, his true beloved, will betray him in her blood. Kalin shot to her feet. No! Her hands balled into fists. I would never hurt him. I would never betray him. Shota calmly sipped her tea. Sit down, Mother Confessor. Kalin fought to keep the tears back as she sank into her chair. I don't control the future memories any more than I control the past. I told you, you must have the courage to hear the answers. She tapped a finger to her temple. Not only here, she tapped the finger over her heart, but here, too. Kalin made herself take a deep breath. Forgive me, it's not your fault, I know that. Shota lifted an eyebrow. Very good, Mother Confessor. Learning to accept the truth is the first step to gaining control of your destiny. Shota, I don't mean this to sound disrespectful, but seeing the future does not provide all the answers. Before, you told me that I would touch Richard with my power. I thought that would destroy him. I tried to kill myself to prevent your words from coming to pass, to prevent myself from hurting him. Richard wouldn't allow me the chance at suicide. As it turned out, your seeing of the future was true, but there was more to it, and it turned out differently than we thought. I touched Richard, but his magic protected him, and my touch didn't harm him. I didn't see the result of the touch, only that you would touch him. This is different. I see you both being wedded. Kalin felt numb. Who is it to be that I will marry? I see only a misty form. I cannot see the person. I do not know his identity. Shota, I was told that a witch woman seeing of future events is a form of prophecy. Who told you this? A wizard, Zed. Wizards, Shota muttered. They don't know what is in a witch woman's mind. They think they know everything. Kalin pushed her long hair back over her shoulder. Shota, we were going to be honest with each other, remember? Shota let out a dainty grumble. Well, I guess that in this case, they may be mostly right. Prophecy does not always turn out how it seems. The dire dangers can be avoided or changed. Do you think there is any way I can change the prophecy? Shota frowned. The prophecy? The one you mentioned, betraying Richard. Shota's frown deepened into suspicion. Are you saying that this was also foretold in a prophecy? Kalin's eyes turned away from the witch woman's intense gaze. When the wizard came, with Jagang possessing his mind, Jagang said that he had invoked a prophecy to trap Richard. It too says I will betray him. Do you remember this prophecy? Kalin rubbed her finger around the rim of her teacup. It's one of those memories that we spoke of, the memories we wish we could forget but we can't. On the red moon will come the firestorm, the one bonded to the blade will watch as his people die. If he does nothing, then he and all those he loves will die in its heat, for no blade forged of steel or conjured of sorcery can touch this foe. To quench the inferno, he must seek the remedy in the wind. Lightning will find him on that path, for the one in white, his true beloved, will betray him in her blood. Shota leaned back, taking her teacup with her. It is true, as you say, that the events in prophecy can be altered or avoided, but not in a double-bind prophecy. This one is such a prophecy, a trap that ensnares its victim. The red moon proves that the trap has sprung. But there must be a way. Kaylin pushed her hands back into her hair. Shota, what am I to do? You are to be wedded to another, she whispered, as is Richard. What is beyond I don't see but this much of it is the future. Shota, I know you're speaking the truth, but how can it be that I would betray Richard? I'm telling you the truth. I would die before I would betray him. My heart won't allow me to betray him. I couldn't. Shota smoothed a loose wisp of her dress. Think, Mother Confessor, and you will see that you are wrong. Just as I showed you that you were wrong, that I could no longer harm you. How? How could I do such a thing when I know it isn't in me for any reason to betray him? Shota took a patient breath. 
It is not nearly so difficult as you wish to think. What if you knew, for example, that you had only one way to save his life, and that way was to betray him, but in so doing you would lose his love? Would you make the sacrifice of his love to preserve his life? The truth now. Kalin swallowed past the lump in her throat. Yes. I would betray him if it was to save his life. So you see, it is not as impossible an event as you imagined. I guess not, Kalin said in a small voice. She pushed at a few crumbs on the table. Shota, what is the purpose of all this? Why would the future hold that Richard will marry Nadine and that I will marry another man? There must be a reason. It goes against everything we both want, so there must be some force pushing events down that path. Shota said after a moment's deliberation, The temple of the winds hunts Richard. The spirits have a hand in this. Kaelin's face sank wearily into her hands. You said to Nadine, May the spirits have mercy on him. What did you mean by that? The underworld contains more than just the good spirits. The spirits, good and the evil, are all involved in this. Kaelin didn't want to talk anymore. It was too painful, talking about the ruination of her dreams and hopes as if they were pieces on a game board. To what purpose, she mumbled. The plague. Kaelin looked up. What? It has something to do with the plague and the thing of magic the dreamwalker stole from the Temple of the Winds. You mean that it could be that this could somehow be part of our attempt to find the magic to stop the plague? I believe it is so, the witch woman said at last. You and Richard are desperately seeking a way to stop the plague and save the lives of countless people. I see in the future that you each wed other people. For what reason would both of you make such a sacrifice? But why would it be necessary you seek something I cannot answer? I cannot alter what will be, nor do I know the reason for it. We are forced to consider the possibilities. Think. If the only way to save all those people from dying in a firestorm of plague were for Richard and you to sacrifice your life together, perhaps, say, to prove your true devotion to protecting innocent lives, would you both do such a thing? Kaylin put her trembling hands in her lap under the table. She had seen the pain in Richard's eyes when he had watched that boy die. She knew her own pain. They had both seen innocent, sick children who were going to die. How many more would die? She would never be able to live with herself if the only way to save those children was to sacrifice her love, and she refused. How could we not? Even if it would kill us, how could we not? But how could the good spirits demand such a price? Kaelin suddenly remembered Denna's spirit, taking the Keeper's mark from Richard and freely choosing to go in Richard's place to eternal torment at the Keeper's hands. That it turned out that Denna didn't have to face that fate didn't matter. She thought that she would, and had sacrificed her soul in the place of one she loved. The branches of a nearby maple tree clacked together in the gentle breeze. Kalin could hear the flags atop Shota's palace snapping in the wind. The air tasted of spring. The grasses were a bright new green. Life was beginning to bud all around. Kalin's heart felt like dead ashes. Then I will tell you one other thing, Shota said, as if from a great distance. Kalin listened from the bottom of a well of despair. You have not heard the last message from the winds. You will receive one more involving the moon. This will be the consequential communion. Do not ignore it, nor dismiss it. Your future, Richard's future, and the future of all those innocent people will hinge on this event. Both of you must use all you have learned in order to comprehend the chance you will be offered. Chance? Chance for what? Shota's gaze riveted Kalin. The chance to carry out your most solemn duty. The chance to save all the innocent lives of those who depend upon you to do what they cannot. How soon? I only know it will not be long. Kalin nodded. She wondered why she wasn't crying. It seemed as if this was the most devastating personal tragedy she could imagine, losing Richard, and yet she wasn't crying. She guessed she would, but not now, not here. Kalin stared at the table. Shota, 
You would try to stop us from having a child, wouldn't you? A boy child. Yes. You would try to kill our son if we had one, wouldn't you? Yes. Then how do I know that this isn't just some plot on your part to prevent us from having a child? You will have to judge the truth of my words with your own mind and heart. Kaylin remembered the dying boy's words and the prophecy. Somehow she had known all along that she would never marry Richard. It was all just an impossible dream. When she was young, Kaylin had asked her mother about growing up and having a love, a husband, a home. Her mother had stood before her, beautiful, radiant, statuesque, but wearing her confessor's face. Confessors don't have love, Kaylin. They have duty. Richard was born a war wizard. He had been born for a purpose, duty. She watched the breeze roll a few of the crumbs from the table. I believe you, Kaylin whispered. I wish I didn't, but I do. You're telling me the truth. There was nothing else to say. Kaylin stood. She had to lock her knees to stay upright on her trembling legs. She tried to remember where the Sliff's well was, but she couldn't seem to make her mind work. Thank you for the tea, she heard herself say. It was lovely. If Shota answered, Kaylin didn't hear it. Shota? Kaylin grasped the back of the chair to steady herself. Could you point me in the right direction? I can't seem to remember. Shota was there, taking her arm. I will walk part way with you, child, Shota said in a soft, compassionate voice, so you may find your way. They walked the road in silence. Kaylin tried to find cheer in the warm spring morning. It was still so cold in Aidendrill. It had been snowing when she left. Still, she couldn't find any cheer in the fine day. As they climbed the stone steps cut into the cliff, Kaylin fought to regain a sense of purpose. If she and Richard could somehow save all those people from the plague, it would be a wonderful thing. Most wouldn't care about the sacrifice they made, but that wouldn't lessen the relief she would feel in the sound of a child's laughter or the sight of a mother's joy in her child's safety. There would still be things to live for. She could fill the void with the happiness to be seen in the eyes of her people. She would have done something no other could do. She and Richard would have stopped Jagang from harming all those people. Near the top of the cliff, Kaylin paused at a turn in the steps and looked out at Agaden Reach. It truly was a beautiful place, this valley nestled among the peaks of jagged mountains. She remembered that the keeper had sent a wizard and a screeling to kill Shota. Shota had barely escaped with her life. She had vowed to regain her home. I'm glad you got your home back. I'm glad for you, Shota. I really am. Agaden Reach belongs to you. Thank you, Mother Confessor. Kaylin looked to the witch woman's almond eyes. What did you do to the wizard who chased you out? What I said I would do. I tied him up by his thumbs and I skinned him alive. I sat back and watched as his magic bled from his skinless carcass. She turned and gestured back down into the green valley. I covered the seat of my throne with his hide. Kaylin remembered that that was precisely what Shota had promised to do. It was small wonder that even wizards rarely dared to enter Agaden Reach. Shota was more than a match for a wizard. One wizard, at least, had learned that lesson too late. I can't say I blame you. The Keeper sending him to kill you and all. If the Keeper had gotten you, well, I know how much you feared that. I owe you and Richard a debt. Richard prevented the Keeper from having us all. I'm glad the wizard didn't send you to the Keeper, Shota. Kaylin really meant it. She still knew Shota was dangerous, but the witch woman seemed also to have a compassion that Kaylin hadn't expected. Do you know what he said to me, this wizard? Shota asked. He said he forgave me. Can you believe it? He granted me forgiveness. And then he begged mine. The wind carried some of Kaylin's hair across her face. She pulled it back. Seems a strange thing for him to say, considering... The wizard's fourth rule, he called it. He said that there was magic in forgiveness in the fourth rule, magic to heal, in forgiveness you grant, and more so in the forgiveness you receive. I guess the keeper's minion would say anything to try to get away with what he had done, and to get away from you. I can understand you not being in the mood to forgive him. Light seemed to vanish into the ageless depths of Shota's eyes. 
he forgot to place the word sincere before forgiveness. Chapter 42 Kalin watched the witch woman disappear back into the gloomy forest. Vines hanging down from craggy branches reached out to touch their mistress as she passed, while tendrils and roots stretched up to brush her leg. She vanished into a shroud of mist. Unseen creatures called in low whistles and clicks from the direction she had gone. Kalin turned back to the moss-covered boulder Shota had shown her, and just beyond found the sliff's well. The silver face of the sliff rose from beyond the round stone wall to watch as Kalin approached. Kalin almost wished the sliff hadn't come, as if somehow, if Kalin couldn't get back, none of the things she had learned would come to pass. How was she going to look into Richard's eyes and not scream in anguish? How was she ever going to be able to go on? How would she find the will to live? Do you wish to travel? The sliff asked. No, but I must. The sliff frowned as if well puzzled. If you wish to travel, I will be ready. Kaylin sank to the ground, put her back to the sliff's well, and folded her legs under herself. Was she to give up this easily? Was she to submit meekly to the fates? She didn't have a choice. Think of the solution, not the problem. Somehow things didn't seem as desperate as they had back in the Reach. There had to be a way to solve this. Richard would not so easily give in. He would fight for her. She would fight for him. They loved each other, and that was more important than anything else. Kaylin's mind felt as if it were in a fog. She tried to focus with more resolve. She couldn't just give up. She had to face this with her old determination. She knew that witch women bewitched people. They didn't necessarily do it out of malice. It was just the way they were. It was like a person not being able to help the fact that they were tall or short or the color of their hair. Witch women bewitched people because that was the way their magic worked. Shota had bewitched Richard to an extent. Only the magic of the Sword of Truth saved him the first time. The Sword of Truth. Richard was the seeker. This was the kind of thing a seeker did, solved problems. She was in love with the seeker. He would not so easily give up. Kaylin plucked a leaf and tore little strips from it as she began to reconsider everything she had been told by Shota. How much of it dare she believe? It was all beginning to seem like a dream from which she was just coming awake. Matters could not possibly be as desperate as she had thought. Her father had told her never to give up, to fight with every breath, with the last breath if need be. Nor would Richard give in easily. This wasn't ended yet. The future was still the future, and despite what Shota said, the matter was not yet decided. Something at her shoulder was bothering her. As she thought, she flicked her hand at it, and then went back to tearing strips off the big leaf. There had to be a way to solve this. When she swatted at her shoulder again, her fingers hit the bone knife. It felt warm. Kaylin drew the knife and held it in her lap. The knife was warm. It seemed to pulse and vibrate. It grew so hot that it became uncomfortable to hold. Kaylin watched, wide-eyed, as the black feathers stood up. They danced and waved and twisted in a breeze. Her hair hung limp. The air was dead still. There was no breeze. Kaylin shot to her feet. Sliff! The Sliff's silver face was right there, close. Kaylin backed away a bit. Sliff, I need to travel. Come, we will travel. Where do you wish to go? The mud people. I need to go to the mud people. The liquid features contorted in thought. I do not know this place. It's not a place. They're people. People, Kaylin tapped her chest. They're people like me. I know different peoples, but not these mud people. Kaylin pushed back her hair, trying to think. They live in the wilds. I know places in the wilds. Which one do you wish to travel to? Name it, and we will travel. You will be pleased. Well, it's a place that's flat. It's a grassland, flat grassland. No mountains like here. Kaylin gestured around, but realized that the sliff could see only trees. I know several places like that. Which places? Maybe I'll recognize them. I can travel to a place overlooking the Calisidron River. To the west of the Calisidron. The mud people are farther west. 
I can travel to Tondalan Vale, the Harja Rift, Kia Plains, Ceylon, Harkin Split, Andereth, Picton, the Jokopo Treasure. The what? What was the last one? She knew most of the rest of the places the Sliff named, but they weren't close to the mud people. The Jokopo Treasure. Do you wish to travel there? Kalin held out the warm bone knife, grandfather's knife. Chandalin had told her how the Jokopo had made war on the mud people, and the ancestor spirits had guided Chandalin's grandfather in how to defend his people against the Jokopo. Chandalin had said they used to trade with the Jokopo before their war. The Jokopo had to be close to the mud people. Say the last place again, Kalin said. The Jokopo treasure. At the echoing words, the black feathers danced and twisted. Kaylin shoved the bone knife back in the band around her upper arm. She sprang up onto the stone wall. That's where I wish to go, the Jokopo treasure. I wish to travel to the Jokopo treasure. Can you take me there, Sliff? A silver arm swept her off the stone wall. Come, we will travel to the Jokopo treasure. You will be pleased. Kaylin gasped one quick breath before she was plunged into the quicksilver froth. She let the breath go and inhaled the Sliff. But this time, numbed by troubling thoughts of losing Richard, of his marrying Nadine, she felt no rapture. Zed cackled like a madman. Anne was upside down in his vision. He stuck out his tongue at her in blue, making a long, crude sound. You needn't attempt to pretend, she growled. It seems to be your natural state. Zed moved his legs as if trying to walk upside down through the air. The blood was rushing to his head. Do you wish to die with your dignity, he asked her, or would you rather live? I'll not play a fool. That's the word, play. Don't just sit there in the mud, play in it. She leaned over, putting her head close to his. He was standing on it in the mud. Zed, you can't possibly think such a thing would work. You said it yourself. You are mucking about with a crazy man. It was your suggestion. I suggested no such thing. Perhaps you didn't suggest it, but you were the one who gave me the inspiration. I'll be happy to give you full credit when we tell people the story. Tell people. In the first place, it won't work. In the second place, I realize full well that you would be only too delighted to tell people. That's just one more reason why I won't do it. Zed howled like a coyote. He stiffened his legs and his spine, letting himself topple like a felled tree. Mud splashed on Anne, fuming she wiped a small splat from her nose. At the tall stick fence, grim-faced Nang Tong guards watched the two prisoners, the two sacrifices. Zed and Anne had sat in the mud with their backs to one another and untied the ropes binding their wrists. The guards, armed with spears and bows, didn't seem to care. The prisoners couldn't get away. Zed knew they were right. Happy people had begun to stop by the pig pen at dawn. As the morning wore on, the crowd grew as more people stopped by to chatter with the guards and take a look at the fine offerings. Apparently, everyone was in a good mood because they now had a sacrifice for the spirits. Their lives would be safe after the unhappy spirits were appeased. The guards and the people of the Nang Tong village, watching from the other side of the fence, were now looking less pleased. They fidgeted with the cloth covering their faces, making sure it hid enough and that it was secure. The guards began wiping more ash on their faces and bodies. Apparently, one couldn't be too careful lest the spirits recognize them. Zed tucked his head down between his knees and rolled himself through the wet, sticky slop. He laughed maniacally as he rolled in a circle around Anne's squat figure, sitting on the cold ground. Would you stop that? Zed spread supine in the mud before her. He swept his rigid arms and legs through the mud. Anne, he said in a low tone. We have important business. I think we might have better success if we attempt to carry out those tasks in this world rather than in the underworld after we are dead. I know we can't help if we're dead. It would stand to reason, then, that we need to get away now, wouldn't it? Of course it would, she grumbled. But I don't think... Zed plopped himself down in her lap. She winced in disgust. Her nose wrinkled when he rested his muddy arms around her neck. And... If we do nothing, we die. If we try to fight these people, we will die. Without the use of our magic, we can't escape them. Our only option is to convince them to let us go. We can't speak their language, and even if we could, I doubt we would be able to persuade them. Yes, but 
We have only one chance, as I see it. We must convince them that we are quite loony. This sacrifice is a sacred service to their spirit ancestors. Look at the guards behind my back. Do they look happy? Well, no. If they believe that we're crazy, then they just might think twice before sacrificing us to their spirits. Wouldn't the spirits be insulted to receive a lunatic as a sacrifice? Wouldn't that be disrespectful? We have to make them fear insulting their spirits with two loony people. But that's crazy. Look at it this way. A sacrifice is something like a treaty wedding between two peoples. The bride is the sacrifice of one people to another in the flesh of the new husband, all in the hope for a peaceful and productive future. The bride's new people treat her with respect. The bride's people treat the husband and his people with respect. It's all an arrangement symbolizing unity, continuity, and hope for the future. We are like the bride being offered to the spirits. How would it look if the Nang Tong offered an unworthy, demented bride? If you were one of the spirits, wouldn't you be offended? If I got you in the bargain, I would be. Zed howled at the sky. Anne winced and pulled away from him. It's our only chance, Anne. He leaned close, whispering in her ear. I swear an oath as first wizard that I will never tell anyone how you behaved. He drew back and grinned at her. Besides, it's fun. Remember how much fun it was as a child to play outside, to play in the mud? Why, it was the grandest of things. But it might not work. Even if it doesn't, wouldn't you rather die having fun on the last day of your life instead of sitting here afraid and cold and dirty? Wouldn't you rather have some childlike fun one last time? Let yourself go, prelate, and recall what it was to be a child. Let yourself do anything that comes into your head. Have fun. Be a child. With a serious expression, Anne considered his words. You won't tell anyone. You have my word. You can act with childish glee, and no one but I will ever know. And the Nang Tong, of course. Another of your acts of desperation, Zed? The time for desperation is upon us. Let's play. Anne smiled a sly smile. She stiff-armed him in the chest, knocking him back into the mud. With a riot of laughter, she leaped on top of him. They wrestled like children, rolling through the slop. After a half dozen turns, Anne was a mud monster with arms, legs, and two eyes. The mud split, revealing a pink mouth as she howled with him at the sky. They made mud balls and used the pigs as targets. They chased the pigs. They flopped onto the hard, round backs of the squealing creatures, riding them around until they were tossed off into the mud. Zed doubted that Anne had ever been this dirty in her nine centuries of life. Age 323. He realized while they were having a one-legged game of tag that involved more falling in the mud than hopping progress, that her laughter had changed. Anne was having fun. They stomped through puddles, they chased the pigs, they ran around the enclosure rattling sticks against the fence. And then they hit upon the idea of making faces at the guards. They drew whimsical expressions on each other's faces in mud. They made every rude noise they could think of. They jumped and laughed and pointed at the solemn guards. Anne and Zed got to laughing so hard that they couldn't stand, and like two drunks they rolled on the ground holding their sides. The crowd grew. Worried whispers swept through the onlookers. Anne stuck her thumbs in her ears and wiggled her fingers as she made faces at them. Zed stood on his head and sang a few lewd ballads he knew. Anne laughed hysterically as he mispronounced key words. Zed fell to laughing and then fell in the mud and then Anne fell on him. She sat on his stomach, pinning him to the ground as she tickled him under his arms while he gasped for breath between laughter and tickled her ribs. The two of them had never had so much fun. The pigs cowered in the corner. Suddenly, buckets of water were dumped over the both of them as they were furiously engaged in trying to find each other's most ticklish spots. They looked up. More water rained down on them. As fast as the mud was washed off them, they dived back into it. Ash-covered guards seized them by the arms and held them at spear point while they were once again washed off. Zed peered over at Anne. She peered back. She looked ridiculous, her face emerging from streamers of slop. He giggled and made a face at her. She giggled and made a face back. The men yelled. Zed's cheeks puffed with attempts to halt his laughing. 
The guards shoved them forward, spears poking in their backs. It reminded him of being tickled, and they both laughed. It was as if once uncorked, the laughter had a life of its own. If they were to be sacrificed, what difference did it make? They might as well have the last laugh. The crowd of shrouded figures parted as the two prisoners were led out of the pig's pen. Giggling, Zed held his arm high and waved. Wave at the people, Annie! She made faces instead. Zed liked the idea and imitated her. People shrank back as if seeing a horrifying sight. Some of the women wept and wailed. Zed and Anne laughed and pointed at them as the women ran from the crowd seeking refuge from the lunatics. The tents and onlookers were soon left behind as their captors prodded them on with spears. Before long, the two dirty, smelly, happy sacrifices were out in the hills. Thirty-five or forty Nangtong spirit hunters, all holding ready spears or bows, followed behind. Zed noticed that some of them had brought packs and provisions. First, wizard Zedicus Zool Zarander and prelate Annalina Aldurin skipped along ahead of the spears, laughing and making outrageous, ever-increasing claims as to how many onions they could eat without producing tears. Zed hadn't a clue where they were going, but it was a fine morning to be going there, wherever it was. It's kind of funny, Lord Rawl, Lieutenant Crawford said. Richard gazed out over the boulder field. What's funny about it? The lieutenant bent his head back to peer up the cliff. Well, I meant it's odd. I grew up in rugged mountains, so I've seen places like these mountains my whole life, but this place is odd. He turned and pointed. See that mountain over there? You can see where the rock slide came from. Richard put a hand over his brow to shield his eyes from the low afternoon sun. The mountain the lieutenant was pointing to was rugged and covered with trees, except for the uppermost reaches. On the steep side facing them, a part of it had given way, leaving naked rock to scar the mountain where the rock had broken off. At the bottom of the barren scar lay a boulder field. What about it? Well, look at all the rock at the bottom. That's the portion that broke off the face of the mountain. He gestured to the boulder field they stood atop. This isn't the same. Another soldier approached and saluted with a fist to his heart. He cast a wary glance at Ulick and Egan, who were standing with their arms folded while he waited silently. Nothing, Lord Wall, he said when Richard acknowledged him. Not so much as a flake of rock that's been worked with tools. Keep looking. Try the outer fringes of the boulder field. Look for places where you can crawl down under some of the larger boulders and check under there, too. The soldier saluted and hurried off. There wasn't much of the day left. Richard had told them that he didn't want to stay the next day. He wanted to get back to Aidendrill. Kalin would probably be back that night or possibly tomorrow. He wanted to be there. If she came back. If she was still alive. He broke out in a sweat at the very thought. His knees felt weak. He banished the thought. She would be back. That was all there was to it. She would be back. He made himself quit thinking about it and put his mind to the problem at hand. So what do you think, Lieutenant? Lieutenant Crawford pitched a stone, watching it bounce first off one boulder and then another. The sharp sound echoed off the cliff behind them. It could be that the face of this mountain broke off much longer ago. Then, over all that time, things started growing in, dying, making soil for larger things to grow, and then they died, making yet more soil. It could be that it's been covered over. Richard knew what Lieutenant Crawford was talking about. He knew how a forest in time could cover over rock slides. If you dug in the forest at the bottom of a cliff, you often encountered the bones of the fallen mountain. I don't think so in this case. The lieutenant looked over at him. May I ask why you think not, Lord Roll? Richard stared across the rift to the next mountain. Well, look at that cliff. The face of it is rough and uneven. Yet the rock of the mountain left behind after the face fell away is weathered now. So much of it isn't sharp. It's been worn by time. Some of it is sharp, though. Water gets in the cracks, freezes, and breaks off more of the rock with time. You can see some of those sharp places, but most of it has a softer look. It has the look to me that it happened long before this slide here, yet you can still see most of the rock lying at the bottom of the cliff. Here. There's much less scree. Egan unfolded his arms and brushed back his blonde hair. 
could just be the lay of the land. This cliff faces south, letting the sun in to help things grow, whereas that one faces north, so it's in shade most of the time. The forest wouldn't grow in as well over there, and that would leave the scree exposed. Egan had a point. There's more to it. Richard tilted his head back and looked up the thousands of feet of sheer cliff face towering above them. Half this mountain is gone. That one over there is just a small slide in comparison. Look up at this mountain and try to imagine what it would have looked like before this happened. It's cleaved from the very top all the way down, like a log round split in half. All the rest of the mountains around here are more or less cone-shaped. This one is only half a cone. Even if I'm wrong and half the mountain isn't gone, and it used to be shaped much as we see it now, there would still be an immense amount of rock down here. I mean, even if it used to be much this shape and only a shell of rock 10 or 20 feet thick collapsed, by the towering height alone, there would have to be a huge pile of rubble. This rock is sharp, so it might be pieces broken off by the working of water freezing, but probably, since I can't see any time-worn places, it happened more recently. Yet I just don't see any evidence of the mass of rock that would have had to come off this mountain. Even if it had been covered over in time, I'd think that where we're standing would be a huge mound. The lieutenant glanced about. You have a point. This is pretty much level with the bottom of the rift. If all that rock broke off, there's no mound under the forest down here. Richard watched the soldiers all about, searching through the rock and woods for any sign of the Temple of the Winds. None looked to be finding anything. I can't see that it's down here. I just don't see any reason to believe that the mountain fell down here. Ulick and Egan folded their arms again. The matter is settled as far as they were concerned. Lieutenant Crawford cleared his throat. Lord Rull, if the half of Mount Keimermost that used to be there isn't down here, then where is it? Richard shared a long look with the man. That's what I'd like to know. If it isn't down here, then it must be someplace else. The blonde-headed lieutenant shifted his weight to his other foot. Well, it didn't just get up and walk away, Lord Rawl. Richard turned his scabbard out of the way as he started climbing down off the rocks. He realized he was frightening the man. Richard seemed to be suggesting something that hinted at magic. It must be as you say, lieutenant. It must have fallen and grown over. Perhaps the cleft between the mountains was deeper back then, and the fall simply filled it in, rather than making a mound. The lieutenant liked the idea. It gave him a rock-solid reality. Richard didn't believe it. The cliff face looked peculiar to him. It was too smooth, as if cleaved with a huge sword. Yes, there were jagged places, but that would explain the rock that was at the bottom. It looked to him as though the mountain had been cut off and taken away and over time, water and ice had worked at the smooth face of the cliff, breaking off pieces and making it more craggy, but it was nowhere near as rough as the other cliffs round about. That might explain it, Lord Rall, the lieutenant said. If that's true, though, that would mean that the temple you're looking for must be buried deep underground. With his two huge guards right at his heels, Richard made for the horses. I want to have a look up on top. I want to see the ruins up there. Their guide, a middle-aged man named Andy Millet, was waiting with the horses. He wore simple wool clothes of browns and greens, much like Richard used to wear. His shaggy brown hair hung past his ears. Andy was immensely proud that Lord Rawl had asked him to guide them to Mount Kaimermost. Richard felt a bit sheepish about that. Andy was simply the first person Richard found who knew where it was. Andy, I'd like to go up to the ruins on top. Andy handed Richard the reins to the big roan. Sure enough, Lord Rawl, there's not much up there, but I'll be glad to show you just the same. Big as his two guards were, they mounted lightly, their horses hardly moving under the sudden weight. Richard swung up into the saddle and wiggled his right boot into the stirrup. Can we get up there before dark? Most of that spring snowstorm is melted. The trail should be open. Andy glanced at the sun, which was just about touching a mountain. With the way you ride, Lord of the Roll, I'd say long before. Usually important people slow me down. Or you think I'm the one slowing you down? Richard smiled. He remembered the same thing himself. The more important the person he guided, the slower they went, it seemed. 
The sky was streaked with golds and reds by the time they reached the ruins. The surrounding mountains were cast in deep shadow. The ruins seemed to glow in the honeyed light. There were some once elegant structures now crumbling that looked to have been a part of a larger place, just as Kalin had said. Here and there on the barren mountaintop, parts of walls still stood, their stones not covered by vine and wood, as they would have been down below, but covered with a rust of lichens instead. Richard dismounted and handed his reins to Lieutenant Crawford. The building to the left of the broad road was large by any standards Richard had grown up with, but compared to castles and palaces he had seen since, it was an insignificant structure. The doorway stood empty. Crumbling evidence of a door frame remained, still partly covered with gold leaf. Inside the walls echoed with his footsteps. A stone bench sat in one room of the roofless building. In another room, a stone fountain held snow melt. A twisting hall with most of its barren ceiling still in place led Richard past a warren of rooms. The hall split, leading, he surmised, to rooms at either corner of the building. He followed the left branch to the room at the end. Like all the rooms on this side, it faced the cliff. Hollow rectangles gaped where windows once shielded the room from wind and rain. Beyond, through the openings, was a view past the edge of the cliff to the blue haze of the mountains beyond. This was the place where visitors and supplicants to the temple would have awaited admittance. During their wait, they would have had a glorious view of the Temple of the Winds. If they were turned away, they left with at least that much. He could almost see what those who had stood in this very spot had seen. It was his gift, he knew, that was telling him this, much the way the spirits of those who once held the sword of truth guided him when he used that magic. As he stood staring, he could almost imagine it there, just beyond the edge, a place of grandeur and might. This was where the wizards had taken things of powerful magic for safekeeping. The wizards of old, some of them Richard's ancestors, had probably stood where he stood, looking out at the Temple of the Winds. Richard strolled around outside in the fading light, past the stately columns, peering into guard huts and once magnificent garden structures, touching the deteriorating walls. Even though it all was now crumbling, it was easy for him to imagine the majestic scene it must once have been. He stood in the center of the broad road that ran through the crumbling ruins, feeling his gold cloak billowing out behind in the wind, trying to visualize the place as it had been, trying to get the feel of it, the road, more than the buildings, gave him the eerie feeling of the presence of the temple beyond. This road had once led right into the Temple of the Winds. He strode the wide roadway, imagining striding toward the Temple of the Winds, the winds that had said they were hunting him. He passed along part of a wall in between the hollow stone buildings, feeling the timeless quality of the place, feeling the life that once was here. But where had it gone? How was he to find it? Where else could he look? It had been here, and even now, Richard could almost see it, feel it, sense it, as if his gift were pulling him onward, pulling him home. Abruptly, he was jerked to a halt. Ulick on one side of him and Egan on the other had seized him under his arms and pulled him back. He looked down and saw that another step would have taken him out into thin air. Vultures soared in the updraft, not twenty feet straight in front of him. He felt as if he was standing at the edge of the world. The view was dizzying. The hair on the back of his neck stiffened. More should lie beyond the edge at his feet. He knew it should, but there was nothing there. The Temple of the Winds was gone. Chapter 43 Breathe, Kalin did as she was told, expelling the sliff and pulling in the sharp cold air. The sound of a hissing torch roared in her ears. Her own breath echoed painfully. But she knew what to expect by now, and calmly waited for the world around her to twist back to normal. Except this was not normal. At least it was not the normal she expected. Sliff, where are we? Her voice reverberated around her. Where you wished to travel, the Jokopo treasure. You should be pleased. But if you are not, I will try again. No, no, it isn't that I'm not pleased. It's just that this wasn't what I expected. She was in a cave. The torch wasn't the familiar kind she was accustomed to. 
a length of wood with pitch at the head, but instead was made of bundled reeds. The ceiling nearly brushed her head as she swung her legs down from the sliff's well and stood. Kalin pulled the bundled reed torch from where it was wedged in a split in the rough stone wall. I'll be back, she told the sliff. I'll have a look around, and if I don't find a way out, I'll come back and we'll go somewhere else. She realized that there must be a way out or the torch wouldn't have been there. Or else when I'm through finding what I'm looking for, I'll be back. I will be ready when you wish to travel. We will travel again. You will be pleased. Kalin nodded to the silver face, reflecting the dancing torchlight, then stepped into the cave. There was only one way out of the room she was in, a wide, low passageway. So she went through it, following it as it twisted and turned through the dark brown rock. There were no other corridors or rooms, so she kept going. The passageway led to a broad room, perhaps 50 or 60 feet across, and she found out why this place was called the Jokopo Treasure. Torchlight reflected back in thousands of golden sparkles. The room was filled with gold. Some was stacked in crude ingots or spheres, as if the molten metal had been poured into pots, the pots then broken away. Simple boxes were piled high with nuggets. Other boxes with handles at both ends so they could be carried by two men held a rubble of golden objects. There were several tables, still holding gold discs and shelves along one wall. The shelves held several gold statues, but were filled mostly with rolled vellum scrolls. Kalin wasn't interested in the Jokopo treasure. She didn't take time to inspect the objects all around, and instead made for the corridor on the other side of the room. She didn't want to linger in the room because she was worried and wanted to get to the mud people, but even if she had been interested in looking around, she wouldn't have stayed long. The air smelled awful and made her gag and cough. The foul stench made her head spin and start to hurt. The air in the passageway was better, though not what she would call good. She reached over and felt the bone knife and found it still warm. At least it wasn't hot as it had been. The tunnel began slanting upward as it twisted along. As she went higher, the dark rock became dirt, in places held back with beams. She didn't see any other passages branching off until she began to smell fresh air. One tunnel branched left, and in a few paces, another right. She felt cool air drifting down from the one straight ahead, and so went that way. The flame of the torch whipped and fluttered as she stepped out into the night. The sky glittered with stars. A figure not far away sprang up. Kalin backed a few paces into the cave, glancing both ways to see if there was anyone else waiting outside. Mother confessor, came a voice she knew. Kalin took a step forward and held out the torch into the night air. Chandelin? Chandelin, is it you? The muscular figure rushed into the torchlight. He had no shirt and was smeared with mud. Grass bundles were tied to his arms and head. His straight black hair was slicked down with the sticky mud the hunters used. Even though his face was also smeared with the mud, she recognized the familiar wide grin. Chandelin, she said with a sigh of relief. Oh, Chandelin, I'm so happy to see you. And I, you, Mother Confessor. He advanced toward her to slap her face in the traditional mud people greeting to show respect for another's strength. Kalin held her hands out, warding him. No, stay away. He straightened to a halt. Why? Because there was sickness where I came from in Aidendril. I don't want to get too close to any of you, for fear I might pass the fever on to you and our people. The mud people were indeed her people. She and Richard had been named mud people by the bird man and the other elders, and were now members of the village, even though they lived apart. Chandelin's pleasure at seeing her faded. There is sickness here too, Mother Confessor. Kalin's torch lowered. What? she whispered. Much has happened. Our people are afraid and I cannot protect them. We called a gathering. Grandfather's spirit came to us. He said that there was much trouble. He said he must speak with you and that he would send you a message to come to us. The knife, she said. I felt his call through the knife. I came right away. Yes, just before dawn he told us this. One of the elders came out of the spirit house and said I was to come to this place to wait for you. How did you come to us from the hole in the ground? It's a long story. 
It was magic. Chandalan, I don't have the time to wait until we can call another gathering to speak with the ancestor spirits. There's trouble. I can't afford to wait three days. He lifted the torch from her hand. His face was grim under the mud mask. There's no need to wait three days. Grandfather waits for you in the spirit house. Kaylin's eyes widened. She knew that a gathering lasted only through the night it was cold. How can that be? The elders still sit in the circle. Grandfather told them to wait for you. He too waits. How many are sick? Chandalin held all his fingers up once, and then only one hand a second time. They have great pain in their heads. They empty their stomachs, even though they have nothing in them. They burn with fever. Some begin to turn black on their fingers and toes. Dear spirits, she whispered to herself, have any died? One child died this day, just before Grandfather sent me here. He was the first to become sick. Kaylin herself felt sick. Her head spun as she tried to come to grips with what she was hearing. The mud people didn't usually tolerate other people coming to their village, and they rarely ventured from their lands. How could this have happened? Chandalin, have any outsiders come? He shook his head. We would not allow it. Outsiders bring trouble. He seemed to reconsider. One may have tried to come, but we would not allow her to come to the village. Her? Yes. Some of the children were playing and hunting out in the grassland. A woman came to them asking if she could come to the village. Their children ran back to tell us. When I took my hunters to the place, we could not find her. We told the children that their spirit ancestors would be angry if they played such tricks again. Kaylin feared to ask because she feared the answer. The child who died today. He was one of those children who said they saw the woman, wasn't he? Chandalin cocked his head. You are a wise woman, Mother Confessor. No, I'm a frightened woman, Chandalin. A woman came to aid and drill and talked to children. They have begun to die, too. Did the boy who died say that she showed him a book? When I went on my journey with you, you showed me these things called books that you used to pass on knowledge. But the children here do not know of such things. We teach our children with living words, as our ancestors taught us. The boy did say that this woman showed him pretty colored lights. That does not sound like the books I remember. Kaelin put a hand to Chandalin's arm, a touch that once would have frightened him with the implied threat of a confessor's power, but now worried him for other reasons. You said we should not be close. It doesn't matter now, she reassured him. I can cause no further harm. The same sickness is here that is in Aiden Drill. I am sorry, Mother Confessor, that this sickness and death should visit your home, too. They embraced in friendship and shared fear. Chandalin, what is this place, this cave? I told you of it once. The place with the bad air and the worthless metal. Then we're north of your home? North and west. How long will it take us to get back to the village? He gave his own chest a thump with a fist. Chandalin is strong and runs fast. I left our village as the sun was going down. It takes Chandalin only a couple hours, even in the dark. She surveyed the moonlit grassland beyond the low rocky hill on which they stood. There is enough moon to see our way. Kaelin managed a small smile. And you ought to know that I'm as strong as you, Chandalin. Chandalin returned the smile. It was a wonderful sight to see, even under the circumstances. Yes, I remember well your strength, Mother Confessor. We will run then. The moonlight conveyed intimately the ghostly, boxy shapes of the mud people's village lying hidden on the dark, grass-covered plain. Few lights burned in the small windows. At this late hour, not many people were out, and Kaylin was glad for that. She didn't want to see the faces of these people, see the fear and sorrow in their eyes, and know that many of them would die. Chandalin took her directly to the spirit house, among the communal buildings at the north side of the village. Most of these buildings were bunched close together, but the spirit house sat apart. Moonlight reflected off the tile roof Richard had helped to make. Guards, Chandalin's hunters, ringed the windowless building. Outside the door on a low bench sat the fatherly figure of the Birdman, his silver hair hanging down around his shoulders, shone in the moonlight. He was naked, 
Black and white mud covered his body and face in a tangle of whorls and lines. A mask all in the gathering war, so the spirits could see them. Two pots, one with white mud and the other holding black, sat on the ground at the bird man's feet. She could tell by the glazed look in his eyes that he was in a trance, and speaking would do her no good. She knew what was required. Kalin unbuckled her belt. Chandelin, would you mind turning your back, please, and ask your men to do the same? It was the greatest concession to her modesty that circumstances would allow. Chandelin called out the order to his men in his own language. My men and I will guard the spirit house while you and the elders are inside, Chandelin said to her over his shoulder. When she had slipped off all her clothes and at last stood naked in the cool night air, the silent bird man began applying the gooey mud so that the spirits might see her too. Sleepy chickens sat watching from the nearby low wall. The wall still bore a slash from Richard's sword. She knew she had to do this, to go in and speak with the spirits, but she wasn't eager. Speaking with the spirit ancestors was only done in times of dire need, and while the results sometimes brought the answers needed, they never brought joy. When the birdman had finished covering Kalin with the black and white mud, he silently led her inside. The six elders sat in a circle around the skulls of ancestors arranged in the center. The birdman took his place, sitting cross-legged on the floor. Kalin sat in the circle opposite him to the right of her friend Savadlin. She didn't speak to him. He too was in a trance, seeing the spirit in the center of the circle that she could not yet see. A woven basket sat behind her. Knowing why it was there, she picked it up and reached inside. Hesitantly, she seized a squirming red spirit frog and pressed its back between her breasts, the one place she wasn't painted. The slime from the frog tingled against her skin. She released the spirit frog and took up hands with the elders to either side. It wasn't long before she felt herself spiraling into a daze. The room began its dizzying spin. She was lifted away from the world she knew and carried into a revolving vortex of light, shadow, aroma, and sound. The skulls spun with her. Time twisted, much as it did in the sliff, but not in the same comforting way. This was a disorienting experience that brought sweat to her brow. It also brought the spirit. His glowing form was before her, yet she couldn't recall when it had appeared to her. It was simply there. Grandfather, she whispered in the tongue of the mud people. Chandelin had said that it was his grandfather who had come in the gathering, but she recognized him on a more visceral level. He had become her protector. She felt the connection to the bone that had been his in life. Child, the unearthly sound of his voice coming through the birdman tingled against her flesh. Thank you for heeding my call. What does our ancestor's spirit wish of me? The birdman's mouth moved with the spirit's voice. That which has been partly entrusted to us has been violated. Entrusted to you? What was entrusted to you? The temple of the winds. Kalin's naked flesh prickled with goosebumps. Entrusted to the spirits? The implications made her head swim. The spirit world was the underworld, the world of the dead. How could something like a temple, built mostly of inert materials like stone, be sent to the underworld? The temple of the winds is in the spirit world? The temple of the winds exists partly in the world of the dead and partly in the world of life. It exists in both places, both worlds at once. Both places? Both worlds at once? How could such a thing be possible? The glowing form, like a shadow made of light, lifted a hand. Is a tree a creature of the soil, like the worms, or is it a creature of the air, like the birds? Kalin would have preferred a simple answer, but she knew better than to argue with the dead. Honored Grandfather, I guess the tree is of neither world, yet exists in both. The spirit seemed to smile. So it does, child the spirit said through the birdman, as does the temple of the winds. Kalin leaned forward. You mean the temple of the winds is like the tree with its roots in this world and its branches in your world? It exists in both our worlds. In this world, in the world of life, where is it? Where it always was, on the mountain of the four winds. You know it as Mount Kaimermost. 
Mount Kymermost, Kalin repeated in a flat tone. Honored grandfather, I have been to that place. The temple of the winds is no longer there. It's gone. You must find it. Find it? It looks to have been there at one time, but the rock of the mountain where the temple used to be has collapsed. The temple is gone, except for a few of its outbuildings. There is nothing to find. I'm sorry, honored grandfather, but in our world the roots have died and crumbled. The spirit stood silently. Kalin feared it might become angry. Child, the spirit said, but not through the birdman. The voice came from the spirit itself. The sound was so painful, it was almost more than she could bear. She felt as if the flesh would burn from her bones. Something was stolen from the winds and taken to your world. You must help Richard, or all my blood in your world, all our people, will die. Kalin swallowed. How could something be stolen from the spirit world, the world of the dead, and be brought back to the world of the living? Can you help me? Can you tell me anything that might help me to know how to find the Temple of the Winds? I have not called you here to tell you how to find the winds. The way of the winds will come with the moon. I have called you here to see the extent of what has been released and what will become of your world should this be allowed to stand. Grandfather's spirit spread his arms. Soft light cascaded from them like water coming over a ledge. The light spread in her vision until she saw only white light. The light cleared and she saw death. Corpses like leaves littering the ground in the autumn lay everywhere. They were strewn in the street where they fell. They sat on the steps slumped against railings. They lay in doorways and on dead carts. Kalin's vision was carried through windows as if on the wings of a bird. Bodies lay rotting in homes. She saw them in beds and chairs and halls, stretched out on floors and slumped over one another. The stench gagged her. With her floating vision, Kalin swept to towns and cities she knew, and everywhere it was the same. Death had taken nearly everyone, their bodies black and rotting even before they had died. The few still living, wherever she viewed, wept in unrelieved anguish. Her floating vision returned to the mud people's village. She saw the corpses of people she knew. Beside dead cook fires lay dead mothers holding dead children in their arms. Dead husbands held dead wives. Here and there, orphaned children with tear-stained faces wailed hysterically beside the corpses of parents. Everywhere, the stench was so thick it made her eyes water. Kalin gasped back a sob as she closed her eyes. It did no good. The sight of the dead burned through to the vision in her mind. This, the spirit said, is what will come to pass if that stolen from the winds isn't halted. What can I do? Kalin whispered through the tears. The winds have been violated. That which was entrusted was taken. The winds have decided that you are the path of the price. I have come to show you the results of this violation and to beg you on behalf of my living descendants to fulfill your part when you are asked. And what is the price? I have not been shown the price. But I forewarn you that I do know that there is no way for you to circumvent or avoid it. It must be as it will be revealed to you, or all will be lost. I ask that when the winds show you the path, you take it, lest what I have shown you comes to be. Kalin, tears streaming down her cheeks, didn't have to consider. I will, grandfather. Thank you, child. There is one other thing I would tell you. In our world, where the souls of those departed from your world now reside, there are those existing in the light with the Creator, and those who are forever shadowed from His glory by the Keeper. You mean that there are both good and evil spirits in this? That is an oversimplification that nearly obscures the truth. But it is as near as you and your world would be able to come to comprehending this world. In this our world, all make it what it is. The winds must allow all to mark out the path. Can you tell me how the magic was stolen from the winds? The path was betrayal. Betrayal? Who did they betray? The keeper. 
Kaylin's jaw dropped. She immediately thought of the sister of the dark who had been in Adendril, Sister Amelia. It had to be her. The sister of the dark has betrayed her master? This soul's path was to enter the Temple of the Winds through the Hall of the Betrayer. That is the only way to achieve the initial breach. It was created as a precaution. To tread the Hall of the Betrayer, a person must betray completely and irrecoverably that in which they believe. Since they have irreparably betrayed their cause, they would no longer have reason to enter. The Dreamwalker found a prophecy that could be used to defeat his foe, but to ignite it he needed magic from the winds. The Dreamwalker found a way to force this soul to betray her master, the Keeper, yet still carry out the Dreamwalker's wishes. He did this by at first allowing her to maintain her oath to the Keeper, and by relegating himself to the role of her secondary master, her master in your world alone. Then, with the use of a double bind, he forced her to betray her primary master. She was able to tread Betrayer's Hall with her charge from the Dreamwalker and her obligation to it intact. In this way, the Dreamwalker violated the winds and obtained what he wanted. Those who sent the temple into the winds did, however, make contingency plans, should such a thing happen. The Red Moon was the ignition of these plans. The very word betray had made Kalin's heart pound. Is this the way we must gain entrance to the winds? The spirit considered her, as if weighing her soul. Once the temple of the winds has been violated, that path is closed, and another must be used. But this is not your concern. The winds will issue their requirements in conjunction with the precepts of balance. The five spirits guarding the winds will dictate the path accordingly. Honored Grandfather, how can a place issue instructions? You make it seem as if the winds are alive. I no longer exist in the world of life. Yet when called, I can pass information through the veil. Kalin's head hurt from trying to understand. She wished Richard were here to ask questions. She feared to miss the important one. But, honored grandfather, you can do this because you are a spirit. You lived once. You have a soul. The spirit began fading. The boundary, the veil, was damaged by this event in the winds. I can remain no longer. The scrin, the guardians of the boundary between worlds, pull me back. Because the violation in the winds altered the balance, we cannot return again in a gathering unless the balance is restored. The spirit faded until she could hardly see it. Grandfather, I must know more. Is the plague itself magic? The voice came from a great distance. The magic sent into the winds is of vast power. To use it fully requires vast knowledge. It was used without understanding what was released or how to control it. The plague was begun by this magic, much as a bolt of lightning from a wizard is magic. But if the lightning strikes a tinder grassland, the resulting firestorm is not magic. The plague is like this. It was begun with magic, but it is now simply a plague, as others before random and unpredictable, yet heated by magic. The plague is in Adendril and here. Will it stay confined? No. Jagang didn't realize what he had done. This could end up killing him, too, if allowed to burn out of control. Is it as you showed me already in other places? Has it already been started in these other places, too? The light of the spirit extinguished, like the weak flame of a lamp gone out. Yes came the distant echoing whisper. They had hoped that they could confine the plague to Adendril. That was hope lost. The whole of the Midlands, the whole of the New World, was about to be consumed in the firestorm started by that spark of magic from the Temple of the Winds. In the center of the circle, where the spirit had been, the air swirled as the spirit vanished back into the underworld. In the distance, in the underworld, Kalin heard the soft echo of laughter from a different spirit. The malevolent chuckle made her skin crawl. As Kalin came out of the trance of the gathering, the elders were there standing around her. They were more used to this altered state than she. Her head still spun sickeningly. Elder Bregendaren reached down, offering her his hand to help her up. 
As she took his hand, under the covering of black and white mud, she saw the tokens on his legs. She gazed up into his face at his kindly smile of assurance. He would be dead within the day. Her friend, Savadlin, was there, holding out her clothes. Kalin, despite the mud, suddenly felt very naked. She started pulling on her clothes, trying not to betray her embarrassment, and at the same time chiding herself for such mundane concerns in the face of the impending catastrophe. The gathering was about calling the spirits of the dead, not about being man or woman. Still, she was the only one of the latter, and they were all the former. Thank you for coming, Mother Confessor, the birdman said. We know this homecoming is not the one of joy we all wished. No, she whispered. It's not. My heart sings to see my people again, but the song is tempered by sadness. You know, honored elders, that Richard and I will do what we must. We will not rest until this is stopped. Do you think you can stop such a thing as a fever? Surin asked. Savadlin placed a hand on her shoulder as she buttoned her shirt. The mother confessor and Richard with the temper have helped us before. We know their hearts. Our ancestors said that this is a fever caused by magic. The mother confessor and the seeker have great magic. They will do what they must. Savadlin is right. We will do what we must. Savadlin smiled at her. And then when you have finished, you will come home to your people and be wedded as you planned? My wife, Wesselan, wishes to see her friend, the mother confessor, wedded in the dress she made for you. Kalin swallowed back a cry. There is nothing I could wish that would bring me greater joy, except to see all our people well. You are a great friend to all our people, child, the birdman said. We look forward to the wedding, when you have finished with these matters of the spirits and magic. Kalin glanced at all the eyes watching her. She didn't think these men had witnessed the visions of death she had been shown, or the true nature or dimensions of the epidemic they faced. They had all seen fevers come before, but never one like the plague. Honored elders, if we fail, if we... Her voice faltered. The birdman came to her rescue. If you should fail, child, we know it will not be because you didn't do everything you could. If there is a path, we know you will do all you can to find it. We trust in you. Thank you, she murmured. Tears were watering her vision. She forced herself to hold her chin up. She would only frighten these people if she showed her fear. Kalen, you must wed Richard with the temper. The birdman chuckled softly as if trying to cheer her. He escaped wedding a mud woman before, as I had planned for him. He will not escape wedding you if I have any say. He must marry a mud woman. She felt too numb to return the smile. Will you stay the rest of the night? Savadlin asked. Wesselan would find joy in seeing you. Forgive me, honored elders. But if I am to save our people, I must return at once. I must go to Richard and tell him what I have learned with your help. Chapter 44 A woman stepped out of a doorway into the narrow, deserted alleyway. He had to stop or collide with her. Under her shawl, she wore a thin dress, and he could tell by the way her nipples stood out with the cold that she wore nothing underneath the dress. She thought his smile was for her. It wasn't. It was amusement at the way opportunity sometimes stepped into his path when he least expected it. He guessed it was his extraordinary nature that drew such events to him. Expecting it or not, he was never unprepared to bend events to his advantage. She returned the smile as she ran her hand up his chest and with a single finger stroked the bottom of his chin. There, there, love, care for a bit of pleasure. She wasn't attractive. Nonetheless, the nature of the chance opportunity instantly ignited his need. He knew what this was about. By the way she stood close, commanding his attention, he knew. He had had this kind of encounter before. In fact, he sometimes sought it out. It was more of a challenge. With challenge came a rare form of fulfillment. It wasn't an ideal situation. There were distinct disadvantages such as not being able to allow her screams to bring attention. Yet there were still pleasures to be had, even like this. His senses opened to it. Already he was taking in the details, like dry earth took in a soaking rain. He let the lust take him. Well, he said, drawing the word out, 
Do you have a room? He knew she wouldn't have one. He knew what this was about. She rested a wrist over his shoulder. Don't need no room, love. Just a half silver. Discreetly as possible, he swept his gaze over the close buildings. The windows were all dark. Only a few lights in the distance reflected off the wet stone. This was a warehouse district. No one lived in these buildings. There weren't likely to be many people about, except passers-by like himself. Still, he knew he had to temper his lust with prudence. A little cold to be undressing out here on the cobblestones, isn't it? She put one hand on the side of his face to keep his attention focused on her. Her other hand touched him between his legs. She purred with satisfaction at what she found. Not to worry, love. For a half silver, I'll have some place warm for you to put it. He was enjoying the game. It had been too long. He put on his most innocent, inexperienced expression for her. Well, I don't know. This seems somewhat crude to me. I usually like it best when there's time for the young lady to enjoy it, too. Oh, I do enjoy it, love. You don't think I do this just for the half-silver, do you? Of course not. I enjoy it. It's my pleasure. She was backing toward the doorway she had come from. He let her fingers curled behind his neck guide him with her. I don't carry any money that small. He could almost see her eyes light with her luck. She had yet to learn that her luck this night was going to be bad. You don't, she said, as if preparing to withdraw her offer now that she thought she had snared him with tempting thoughts of what she was offering. Well, a lady has to earn a living. I guess I'll have to move along and see if I can find the smallest I have is a silver. But I'd be willing to give you the whole silver if it would mean you took your time and enjoyed it too. I like lovely young ladies like you to enjoy it. That's what pleases me. What a love, she said with clumsy, exaggerated delight as she took the silver coin when he held it out. She stank. Her smile brought no beauty to her face. Yet he reveled in the details. Coarse hair, the smell of her body, the humped nose and small eyes. She was common, less than a man of his stature was used to. But this had its own delights to offer. He listened carefully as he watched her. Other details were even more important if he was to have his full pleasure from this. She backed into the shallow doorway and sat on a stool waiting there. The doorway was just deep enough to hold them both with his back to the alleyway as he stood before her. It aggravated him that she thought him so ignorant, so foolish, so impetuous. She would learn just how wrong she was. She planted a kiss on the front of his trousers as she fumbled with his belt. It wouldn't be long. She wouldn't want it to take too long before she moved on to another place, reaping all the coin she could in the cloak of night. Before she undid his trousers, he gently took her wrists in one hand. It wouldn't do to have his trousers down around his knees when it started. No, that wouldn't do at all. She smiled up at him, clearly puzzled, but just as clearly sure she was bewitching him with her smile. He wouldn't have to suffer it for long. It wouldn't be long. It was dark enough too dark to see for sure what he was doing. People saw what they expected. While she still smiled at him before she had time to question, he reached down with his other hand and gripped her neck. She thought he simply wished to hold her while she performed her service. The way her head was tilted back was perfect. With a thumb and a small grunt of effort, he crushed her windpipe. The smile transferred to his face. The choking sound wouldn't immediately raise suspicions. People heard what they expected to hear, just as they saw what they expected to see. He hunched over her to make it look as expected while he crushed the life out of her. Surprise, he whispered to her bulging eyes. He luxuriated in her startled, strangled expression. When her arms went limp, he let them drop and held her up by a fistful of her hair. He bent her head back over his thigh to help hold her up as he waited. He had to wait only seconds before he heard the careful footsteps approaching from behind, more than one man as he had expected. He knew what this was about. Robbery. Mere seconds more and they had closed the distance. To him, time stretched with the anticipation, with the details of sights, sounds, and smells. He was the most rare of men. He owned time. He owned life. He owned death. And now it was time for the rest of his pleasure. 
He pushed his knee up against her spine and with a quick yank snapped her neck over his leg. He spun, bringing his knife up into the man right behind, slicing him open from his groin to his sternum. He spun past the man as guts slopped out into the alley. He expected another man. There were two. A woman like this usually had two men to rob the man. He had never before seen three. The unexpected danger of this development made him reel with lust. The second man on the right swung an arm. He saw the knife in the fist and with a step back escaped the sweep of the blade. As the third man advanced, he drove him back with a boot to the point at the base of the breastbone. The man smacked the wall behind and stumbled to his knees with a grunt of pain, unable to regain his breath. The man on the right froze. In that instant, it was one on one. The face was that of a boy, really, hardly a man yet. With a boy's courage, he broke and ran. He smiled. There was no more perfect target as they ran than a person's head. The head remained nearly still while the arms and legs flailed furiously. That target was a core of stability in his vision. He loosed his knife. The boy ran as fast as his rapidly pumping legs would carry him. The knife was faster, hitting home with a solid thunk. The young thief went down instantly. The third man was coming up from his knees. He was older, muscled, heavy, and violently angry. Good. A sidekick broke the man's nose. Howling in pain and rage, the man sprang forward. He saw a flash of steel and dodged to the side as he swept a leg beneath the man, taking his feet from under him. It all happened in a blink. It was a glorious event, this dangerous raging bull charging madly. He pulled in the details, the man's clothes, the small rip in the back of his coat, his bald spot reflecting the distant light, his curly greasy hair, the nick missing out of his right ear, the way he flopped when the boot landed between his shoulders. It was when he was twisting the man's arm behind his back that he saw the blood. Blood was something he kept careful track of. This blood surprised him. He hadn't cut the man, yet. Nor was this blood from the man's crushed nose. He rarely had a thrill of surprise such as this unexpected blood brought. He realized the man was screaming in pain. He screamed louder when the shoulder joint popped. He dropped onto the man's back and smacked his head with the heel of a hand, breaking the man's teeth against the cobbles and quieting him somewhat. He gripped the greasy hair in a fist and pulled the man's head back, listening to the sound of the grunts. Robbery is a dangerous business. Time you paid the price. We wouldn't have hurt you, the man burbled. Just robbed you, you bastard. Bastard, is it? Carefully, slowly, Enjoying the detail of every inch, he slit open the man's throat as he thrashed. What unexpected pleasure this night had brought. He lifted his hands, curling his fingers, slowly sweeping the quintessence of death from the air, capturing the silken substance of it as it lifted in the darkness and pulled it back to himself. He was the fulfillment of their lives. He was the balance. He was death. He savored seeing that awareness in their eyes. He liked it best when he could bask in that look, that knowledge, that terror. It brought him fulfillment. It made him complete. He stood swaying in ecstasy at the cloying scent of blood. He regretted it hadn't lasted longer. He regretted not being able to enjoy prolonged screams. Screams were rapture. He craved them, needed them, lusted after them. Screams fulfilled him, made him whole. He needed the screams, not the actual sound of them. He often gagged his partners, but the attempt at them and what they represented, terror. Being denied the chance to leisurely enjoy the screaming terror left him unfulfilled, his lust unsated. He glided up the alley and found that his skill was as sharp as ever, as was his knife. It had found its target. The boy lay crumpled on his side. He looked delicious with the knife buried to the cross guard at the back of his head and the point of the heavy blade jutting from his forehead, just slightly off-center. Immersed in a pool of sensation, he realized he felt a new one. Pain. Surprised, he inspected his arm and discovered the source of the unexpected blood. He had a gash a good six inches long on the outside of his right forearm. It was deep. It would need to be stitched. The pleasure of such an unexpected occurrence made him gasp. Danger, death, and damage, all in one night, in one chance encounter. This was nearly too much. 
The voices had been right about coming to aid and drill. Still, he hadn't had what he needed. The prolonged terror, the careful cutting, the slicing, the binge of blood, the giving of endless, exquisite pain, the orgy of frenzied stabbing at the end. But the voices from the ethers promised him he would have those things, promised him he would have the ultimate conquest, the ultimate balance, the ultimate pairing. They promised him he would have the ultimate consummation of debauchery. They promised him he would have the mother confessor. His time was coming. Her time was coming. Soon. When Verna dabbed the wet cloth against Warren's forehead, his eyes opened. She let out a long breath of relief. How are you feeling? He tried to sit up. With a firm hand on his chest, she gently pushed him back down into the hay. Just you lay there and rest. He winced in pain and then smacked his lips. I need a drink. Verna twisted and lifted the dipper from the bucket. She held it to his lips. His hands cupped the dented bowl of the dipper as he greedily gulped down all the water. He panted, catching his breath after the long drink. More. Verna dragged the dipper through the bucket and let him drink his fill. She smiled down at him. Glad to see you awake. It looked to be an effort for him to return the smile. Glad to be awake. How long have I been out this time? She shrugged discounting his concern. A few hours. He glanced around the inside of the barn. Verna lifted the lamp so he could see his surroundings. Rain drummed against the roof, making it feel cozy inside. Verna set down the lamp and rested on an elbow beside him. Not fancy lodging, but at least it's dry. He had been nearly unconscious when they found the farm. The family who owned the farm was sympathetic. Verna had refused the offer of their bed, not wanting to force them to sleep in their own barn. On her journey of over twenty-odd years, Verna had often slept in such places and found the accommodations agreeable, if a little rough. She liked the smell of hay. When she was on her journey, she had thought she hated it, but once returned to the cloistered life at the Palace of the Prophets, she changed her opinion and found herself longing for the smell of hay, dirt, grass, and rain-clean air. Warren laid a gentle hand over hers. Verna, I'm sorry I'm slowing us down so. Verna smiled. She recalled a time when her impatient nature would have had her pacing and fretting. Warren and his love brought out a little of her calmer nature. He was good for her. He was everything to her. She pushed back his curly blonde hair and kissed his forehead. Nonsense. We had to stop for the night anyway. The rain would have made traveling slow and miserable. A good rest will result in more progress in the end. Take my word. I've had plenty of experience at such things. But I feel so useless. You are a prophet. That provides us with information that is far from useless. That in itself has saved us from traveling days in a wrong direction. His troubled blue eyes turned to the rafters. The headaches are coming more often with time. I fear to think that when I close my eyes, I may never come awake again. She scowled for the first time that night. I'll not hear that sort of talk, Warren. We will make it. He hesitated, not wanting to argue with her. If you say so, Verna. But I'm slowing us down more all the time. I've taken care of that. You have? What have you done? I hired us transportation. For a ways, at least. Verna, you said you didn't want to hire a coach. That it would draw attention to us. You said you didn't want to risk being recognized, and you didn't want nosy people inquiring as to who was riding a coach. Not a coach and I don't want to hear a string of objections. I hired this farmer to take us south for a ways in his hay cart. He said we could lay in the back and you could rest. He'll cover us with hay so we won't have to worry about people bothering us. Warren frowned. Why would he do this for us? I paid him well. More than that, though, he and his family are loyal to the light. He respects the sisters of the light. Warren relaxed back into the hay. Well, I guess that sounds good. You're sure he's willing? You didn't twist his nose, did you? He was going anyway. Really? Why? Verna sighed. He has a sick daughter. She's only twelve. He wants to go get some tonic for her. Suspicion darkened Warren's expression. Why didn't you cure the girl? Verna held his gaze. I tried. I couldn't cure her. She has a high fever. She's cramping and vomiting. I tried my best. 
I would have given nearly anything to have been able to cure that poor child of her suffering, but I couldn't. Any idea why not? Verna shook her head sadly. The gift doesn't cure everything, Warren. You know that. If she had a broken bone, I could help her. If she had any number of ills, I could help her. But the gift is of limited use for fever. Warren looked away. Seems unfair. They offer to help us, and we can do next to nothing for them. I know, Verna whispered. She listened to the rain against the roof for a time. I was able to ease the pain in her gut, at least. She'll rest a little more comfortably. Good. That's good, at least. Warren fussed with a piece of straw. Have you been able to get in contact with Prelate Annalena? Has she left you a message in the journey book yet? Verna tried not to betray how troubled she was. No, she hasn't answered my messages, nor has she sent one of her own. She's probably busy. She doesn't need to be bothered by our little problems. We'll hear from her when she has time. Warren nodded. Verna blew out the lamp. She snuggled up to him, putting her forehead against his shoulder. She rested her arm across his chest. We best get some sleep. At sunrise, we'll be moving on. I love you, Verna. If I die in my sleep, I want you to know that. Verna's fingers stroked the side of his face in answer. Clarissa rubbed the sleep from her eyes. Dawn was leaking in around the edges of the heavy, dark green drapes. She sat up in the bed. She didn't think she had ever awakened feeling this good. She reached over to tell Nathan as much. Nathan wasn't with her. Clarissa sat up and swung her legs over the edge of the bed. When she stretched, her leg muscles protested. They were sore from the night's activities. She guessed it was simply the thought of the cause that made her smile at the mild ache. She had never known that sore muscles could be so pleasant. She stuffed her arms through the lovely pink robe Nathan had bought for her. She snugged the ruffles up around her neck and then tied the silk belt. She wiggled her toes in the thick carpet, luxuriating in the feeling. Nathan was at the writing desk, bent over a letter. He smiled up at her as she stood in the doorway. Sleep well. Clarissa half closed her eyes and sighed. I should say so, she grinned. What sleep I got, anyway. Nathan winked at her. He dipped the pen in a bottle of blue ink and went back to his scratching. Clarissa strolled around behind him and put her hands on his shoulders. He was wearing his trousers and nothing else. With her thumbs, she kneaded the muscles at the base of his neck. He made an agreeable sound deep in his throat, so she continued. She liked to hear his sounds of pleasure, and liked even more being their cause. As her thumbs worked along the muscles of his shoulders, she glanced down at what he was writing. Scanning the letter, she saw that it was instructions about moving troops to places she had never heard of. Nathan wrote on, admonishing a general about the bond to the Lord Rall and the dire repercussion should he ignore it. The tone of the letter was the same authoritative tone he used when he expected people to treat him as the man of importance that he was. He signed the letter, Lord Rall. Clarissa bent and nuzzled his neck, giving his ear a little nip. Nathan, last night was beyond wonderful. It was magic. You were magnificent. I'm the luckiest woman in the world. He gave her a roguish grin. Magic. Yes, there was some of that in it, too. I'm an old man. I need to use what I've got. She combed her fingers through his hair, ordering it. Old man? I don't think so, Nathan. I hope I was half as pleasing to you as you were to me. He laughed as he folded his letter. I guess I did manage to keep up with you. He slipped a hand inside her robe and pinched her bare bottom. She jumped with a squeak. It was one of the high points of my life, to be with such a beautiful and loving woman. She hugged his head to her breasts. Well, we're still alive. No reason we can't reach for some more of those high points. His sly smile grew as he put his hand back on her bare bottom and gave it a squeeze. He had that lusty twinkle in his eye. Let me dispense with this bit of business, and we'll see about getting our money's worth out of that big bed. With a diminutive copper spoon, he scooped little nuggets of red wax from a tin and dumped the tiny spoonful on the folded letter. Nathan, silly, you're supposed to melt the sealing wax onto the letter. One of his eyebrows arched. You should know by now, my dear, that my way is better. She let out a throaty laugh. My mistake. He twirled a finger over the nuggets of wax. Sparkles of light danced from his fingers onto the lumps of wax. 
They glowed briefly and then melted into a red puddle on the letter. She gasped with delight. Nathan was one never-ending little surprise after another. She felt her cheeks warm as she remembered that his fingers were magic in more ways than one. She bent and whispered intimately in his ear, I'd like you and that magic finger of yours back in bed with me, Lord Ra." Nathan lifted his magic finger in proclamation. And it shall be, my dear, just as soon as I send this letter on its way. He again twirled the finger over the letter, and it lifted off the desk as if of its own accord. Clarissa's eyebrows rose in astonishment. The letter floated in the air ahead of him as he walked to the door. He twirled his other hand dramatically, and the door glided open. A soldier, sitting on the floor in the hall, leaning against the opposite wall, rose to his feet. He saluted with a fist to his heart. Nathan, standing there in only his trousers, with his white hair hanging down to his shoulders, had the look of a wild man. She knew he wasn't, but standing there as tall as he was, as commanding as he was, she knew he must look that way to others. People were afraid of Nathan. She could see it in their eyes. She could understand their fear, though. She remembered how much she had feared him before she had come to know him. She could hardly remember now just how much the sight of the towering prophet had terrified her. When he turned those azure eyes on people and his hawk-like brow lowered in displeasure, she thought he could make a whole army turn and run. Nathan stretched his arm out, and the letter floated to the grim-faced soldier. You remember all my instructions, don't you, Walsh? The soldier snatched the letter out of the air and stuffed it inside his tunic. This soldier, though respectful, didn't seem intimidated by Nathan. Of course, you know me better than that, Nathan. Nathan lost a bit of his lofty attitude and scratched his head. I guess I do. Clarissa wondered where Nathan had found the soldier, and when he had had time to give him instructions. She guessed he must have gone out while she was asleep. This soldier looked to be somewhat different from most of the others she had seen. He had a traveling cloak with several packs at his belt, and his clothes were of a higher quality than those of the regular soldiers she was getting used to seeing. His sword was shorter, too, and his knife longer. He was not a small man, either. He was as big as Nathan, but Nathan's bearing made him seem bigger than anyone to her. Give the letter to General Rybish, Nathan said. And don't forget, if any of those sisters start asking you questions, you warn them about what I said, and tell them that Lord Rahl ordered you to keep what you were told to yourself. That will keep their jaws locked tight. The soldier smiled knowingly. I understand, Lord Rahl. Nathan nodded. Good. What about the others? Soldier Walsh gestured vaguely. Bolsden will be around to let you know what he finds out. I'm pretty sure it was only Jagang's expeditionary force, but Bolsden will find out for sure. Large as it was, it wasn't much compared to the main force. I don't see any evidence that his main force down near Graffin Harbor has come north yet. From what I've heard, Jagang is content to sit and wait for something. I don't know what that something is, but he's not rushing troops north into the New World. He thrust the army I saw deep into the New World. I still think it was just his expeditionary force. Jagang is a patient man. It took him years to conquer and consolidate the old world under his rule. He used much the same tactics. Sending out the expeditionary force to take a key city or capture information of one sort or another, mostly records and books. Those men are brutal. That's part of their purpose, too. But it's the books they're sent to get. They would send back whatever they captured and wait to go wherever Jagang sends them next. Bolsden has some of our men checking into it, but they have to be careful, and it may take them a while. So just enjoy the wait. Nathan stroked his chin as he pondered. Yes, I imagine Jagang isn't eager to send his army into the New World yet. He returned his gaze to Walsh. You'd best be on your way. Walsh nodded. His gaze shifted and his eyes met Clarissa's. He looked back to Nathan, a small smile coming to his lips. A man after my own heart, Nathan chuckled softly. One of nature's wonders, matters of the heart. The way Nathan said the words made Clarissa's own heart swell with pride to be included in matters of his heart. You be careful here in the rat's nest, eh, Nathan? I'd not like to hear that you don't have eyes in the back of your head after all. He patted his tunic where he had put the letter. Especially not after I deliver this. I will, lad. You just be sure you get that letter delivered. You have my word. 
After Nathan shut the door and business was finished, he turned to her. He had that twinkle in his eye, that lusty twinkle. His sly smile returned. Alone at last, my dear. Clarissa squealed and ran for the bed in mock fright. Chapter 45 What do you think is going on? Anne asked. Zed stretched his head up to try to see. It was hard to get much of a look past the wall of legs around them. The Nang Tong spirit hunters jabbered orders, which he couldn't understand, but some of the spears pointing down from the circle surrounding them settled on his shoulders, delivering an unequivocal message that he had better stay where he was. He and Anne sat cross-legged on the ground, guarded by a ring of Nang Tong, while others of them were sitting in conference a ways off with a party of Si Duk. They're too far away to hear clearly, but even if we could hear them, it probably wouldn't help much. I only speak a few words of Si Duk. Anne plucked a long blade of grass and wound it around a finger. She didn't glance over at Zed. They didn't want to give their captors the idea that they were sane and capable of plotting. Anne let out a high-pitched cackle just to keep up appearances. What do you know about these Si Duk? Zed flapped his arms like a bird about to take to wing. I know they don't sacrifice people. A guard thunked a spear shaft on Zed's head, as if to discourage him from any ideas of flying off. Zed howled with laughter instead of cursing, which he was longing to do. Anne glanced over out of the corner of her eye. Beginning to reconsider your attitude about letting these Nang Tong live as they wish? Zed smiled. If I wanted to let them live as they wish, we'd be in the spirit world by now. Just because you believe in letting wolves be, that doesn't mean you have to let them eat your flock at will. She grunted to concede the point. Off in the distance, beside a slight rise, the negotiations dragged on. About ten of the Nang Tong and an equal number of the Si Dok sat cross-legged in a circle. The Nang Tong counted out loud, accompanied by exaggerated arm movements. They pointed Zed's way. They made unintelligible but seemingly heartfelt speeches. Zed leaned toward Anne and whispered, The Si Dok are peaceful enough as far as I know. I've never heard of them making war or using force against neighbors, even weaker neighbors. But when it comes to matters of trade, they're ruthless. Most people in this part of the wilds would just as soon bargain with a wolf. Other peoples teach their young people to fight. The Si Dok teach them to barter. Anne looked off in the other direction as if disinterested. What makes them so good at it? Zed glanced up at their guards. They were all watching the bargaining and paying little attention to the helpless prisoners. They have the rare ability to walk away from a deal. Others get their mind set on something and soon start settling for less just to have a deal. The sea doke won't do that. They'll simply walk. When need be, they'll cut their losses without regret and move on to something else. One of the sea doke the one wearing a rabbit fur over his head, slapped a pile of blankets in the center of the circle. He pointed off to a small herd of goats and made an offer Zed understood to include two of the animals. The offer seemed to incense the Nang Tong. Their chief negotiator leaped to his feet and stabbed his spear at the sky repeatedly, apparently to express his outrage at the low price. Zed noted that he didn't walk away. There was honor involved. The Nang Tong had that much invested. Zed nudged Anne. He tilted his head back and howled like a coyote. Anne, getting the message, joined in. They both yelped and bayed as loud as they could. The negotiators fell silent as they all looked toward the prisoners. The head Nang Tong negotiator sat back down. A thunk on both their heads silenced Zed and Anne. Talking resumed over at the bartering session. A Nang Tong emissary was sent to have a better look at the goats. Zed scratched his shoulder. The dry mud was getting uncomfortable. He guessed it was less uncomfortable than having his heart cut out or his head cut off, or whatever it was the Nang Tong did to sacrifices. I'm hungry, he muttered. They haven't fed us all day. It's near to mid-afternoon and they haven't fed us. He barked at his captors to show his displeasure. The negotiations halted for a moment while they once again looked toward the prisoners. The sea doke all folded their arms and remained silent as they stared at the Nang Tong. The Nang Tong quickly resumed talking, their tone changing, becoming conciliatory. Chuckling interspersed their casual chatter. The Si Dok's response was short and curt. 
The one with the rabbit skin on his head gestured toward the afternoon sun and then off toward his home. The Nang Tong man in charge pulled a blanket from the stack in the center and inspected it with grudging admiration. He passed the blanket to his fellows. They nodded with appreciation of its worth, as if just discovering it. The man sent to have a look at the goats returned with two. He showed them off to his associates, and they oohed and awed, as if realizing for the first time that these goats were much more impressive than they had at first thought, and not at all the scraggly animals they had expected to find. The Nang Tong had apparently decided that no matter what, they didn't want to return home with the prisoners. Any useful commodities were better than two crazy people. They couldn't very well send the spirits to crazy people. Any exchange for them was better than nothing, especially in view of the waning interest of the Sea Dok. The Sea Dok remained stone-faced. The Nang Tong had made a mistake. They had betrayed their need to sell what they had. There was nothing the Sea Dok valued more than a motivated seller. A price, whatever it was Zed couldn't tell, was suddenly agreed upon. The head Si Dok and the head Nang Tong stood, hooked arms at the elbows, and turned around each other three times while so locked together. When they parted, both sides fell to happy chatter. A bargain had been struck. The Nang Tong started lifting blankets. The goats were tethered. The Si Dok headed for their prizes. The guards thunked Zed and Ann on the head as the Si Dok approached, apparently in warning not to spoil the deal. Zed had no intention of spoiling the deal. The Sea Dok didn't sacrifice people. As far as he knew, they were gentle people. The worst punishment they dispensed to someone who committed a grievous wrong was banishment. A banished Sea Dok sometimes starved to death because he was so heartsick at being sent from the only home he knew. A misbehaving child was set straight by everyone ignoring him for a day. It was a horrifying punishment to a Sea Dok child and resulted in best behavior for a good long time after. Of course, Zed and Anne weren't members of the Sea Dok community, so it was entirely possible, in fact probable, that such treatment didn't extend to them. Zed leaned toward Anne and whispered, I don't think these people would hurt us, so keep that in mind. If they decide not to take us, the Nang Tong may just slit our throats rather than have to suffer the humiliation of having to return with two crazy people. First you want me to play in the mud, and now you want me to be a good little girl? Zed smiled at her sarcasm. Just until our new keepers take us away from the old. The Sea Dok Elder, the one with the rabbit fur over his head, squatted before his new acquisitions. He reached out and felt Zed's arm muscles. He grunted disapprovingly. He felt Anne's arms and made a sound as if pleased at what he found. Anne lifted an eyebrow to Zed. Seems I'm more agreeable to them than a skinny old man. Zed smiled. I think they find you better suited as a human oxen. They'll give you the hard work. Her satisfied expression vanished. What do you mean? He shushed her. Another sea dok squatted down beside the elder. He had goat antlers fixed to his head. He wore what had to be a hundred necklaces over his buckskin tunic. The necklaces, some hanging to his crotch, others tight at his throat, and the rest every length in between held teeth, beads, bones, feathers, pottery shards, metal discs, gold coins, small leather pouches, and carved amulets. He was the Sea Dok Shaman. The Shaman took Zed's hand and gently held his arm out. He released it. Zed let it drop. The Shaman chattered his disapproval. Zed understood enough to gather that he was supposed to hold his arm up. He didn't let on that he understood any of the words, and instead let the shaman lift the arm out again and use a hand signal to indicate he meant Zed to hold it there. While the Nang Tong guard still held spears on the two prisoners, the shaman retrieved long, coiled stalks of grass from one of the pouches at his waist. He chanted as he wove the grass around Zed's wrist. When finished, he wove the grass around Zed's other wrist and then did the same to Anne. Any idea what this is about? she asked. It binds our magic. The Nang Tong need do nothing to render our magic useless, but the Sea Dok have to use some kind of magic of their own to suppress ours. This shaman is a man of magic. He has the gift. He's something like the Sea Dok's wizard, Zed glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. Or maybe you could say he's like the Sisters of the Light with their collars. Like the collars, we won't be able to get these wristbands off. Once they had the grass woven around their wrists, the Nang Tong withdrew their weapons, picked up their portion of the blankets, collected their two goats, and quickly made good their escape. 
The elder, the one with the rabbit skin on his head, leaned toward Zed and spoke. When Zed frowned and shrugged that he didn't understand, the man added sign language, seemingly invented on the spot. He indicated chores to be done and time by showing the seasons, digging at the ground and pretending to plant, the heat of summer and the freezing of winter. Zed couldn't understand a great deal of it, but he understood enough. He turned to Anne. I believe that these fellows here have purchased us out of our death sentence. We are to be in servitude to them for a period of about two years, to repay them for our cost, plus a profit for their trouble. We've been sold into slavery? It would appear so, but only for a couple of years. Quite generous of them, actually, considering that the Nang Tong were going to kill us. Maybe we could buy our way out. To the sea, Doc, this is a personal debt we owe them, and can only be repaid with personal servitude. To their way of looking at it, they have returned our lives to us, and so we must use part of those lives to show our gratitude. And to clean up after them. Clean up? We're to scrub floors to repay our debt? I imagine they'll want us to cook, carry things, so care for their animals, those sort of things. As if to confirm what Zed had told her, the sea dok began pulling the thongs holding their water skins off over their heads and passing them to Zed and Anne. What do they want? Anne asked him. Zed lifted an eyebrow. They want us to carry their water. Three more of the sea dok appeared with the remaining blankets, divided them, and handed them to their new bearers. Do you mean to tell me? Anne growled that the first wizard of the Midlands and the prelate of the Sisters of the Light have been sold into slavery for the price of some blankets and two goats? With a shove from behind, Zed staggered after the departing sea doak. I know what you mean, he said over his shoulder. For the first time I know of, the sea doak have overpaid. Zed stumbled and dropped half his load of water skins. As he regained his balance, he stepped on one that had snagged a thorny berry bush. Bending to retrieve the water skins, his stack of blankets toppled into the mud puddle created by the burst water skin. He put a knee to the ground to regain his balance as he gathered up the scattered water skins. His knee squashed the berries under the blanket. Oops! He waved an apology to the sea doak. Sorry! The sea doak leaped about in agitation, demanding he pick everything up at once. The man whose water skin Zed had ripped open over a thorn bush pointed angrily at his damaged property while jabbering demands of recompense. I said I was sorry, Zed protested, even though they couldn't understand him. He bent to gather up the wet blankets. He lifted one up high and held it out between his widespread arms, inspecting it. Oh, dear, look at that. We'll never get that stain out. Chapter 46 Lord Rall, you have had a hard ride, Berdine said. I think you should be resting. We should go back, so you can rest, I mean. The massive rampart, lit by the mellow light of the low sun, spread out before the three of them like a broad road. He wanted to be out of the keep before dark. Not that the light of day would save him from dangerous magic, but somehow being in the wizard's keep after dark seemed worse. Raina leaned past him to speak. It was your idea, Berdine. My idea? I never suggested any such thing. Quiet, both of you, Richard murmured. He was considering the feel of magic against his skin. They had advanced halfway across the long rampart toward the first wizard's private enclave before the distinct caress of magic began tingling against his flesh. Both Mord Sith had balked at its feel. Kaelin had told him about this place, about the first wizard's private enclave. She said that she used to come up to this rampart because it provided a beautiful view of Aedendril. And indeed, there was that. But there was also the magic of powerful shields. Those shields kept everyone out of this small corner of the wizard's keep.